Let me know when we're ready. Good morning and welcome to the School of Electrical, Computer and Energy Engineering Senior Design Demo Day. We'll be interviewing 29 teams today and the students have been working on these projects for a year. So we are going to start with our first team, Ainsy, Ainsy 87 Relay. Justin, can you please tell me about your project? So we designed a current differential for a single phase transformer. Um, basically it's a protection device that protects uh, critical components in power systems. So, so it protects critical components and power systems? Yes. What is that? So basically, high power systems uh, need something to protect from faults or shorts to ground. Um, these kind of faults can cause fires, uh, hurt people, uh, damage equipment. Um, we're talking millions of dollars when we're talking about components this large. Um, and so these type of devices can monitor um, the waveforms on these lines, sense a difference in them, and then send a signal to a device which will open the circuit protecting that, that component. That's interesting. And so is this what this board is showing us here? Yes, yes it is. Um, Troy, can you tell me about the components on this board? Sure. So uh, in the center is the transformer itself. So there's two sides. Of, there's a primary side and a secondary side. Um, power is being applied up here at the top. Um, it's going through the uh, transformer, power comes around to the other side. On either side of this, uh, this is the lower part of the transmission line on both. Uh, it's not a uh, current transformer, it's actually sampling the amount of current flowing through the power line. So there's one here and there's a smaller one on this side. So those two are actually paying attention and keeping track of what's happening on the transmission line on either side of the transformer. It's then feeding that signal down to these boards here and that gets fed off to the actual current differential itself. So this is, this is the actual current differential. This is the device that actually looks and makes the decision on whether or not there's a fault and if it sees a fault it sends a signal out via these relays here and this is our actual circuit breaker. So if this sees there's a problem it opens this thing up and it isolates everything. Very interesting. You guys have a lot of components here. Jonathan, can you tell me how much this all costs you? Uh, it'd be in the range of $300 across um, these components. Uh, honestly, just to make it straight, if we hadn't uh, had it, all the uh, uh, failure pass along the way, probably would have mm -hmm. been about uh, $150. Okay. Um, but we just need different function generators and different components along the way um, before we finalized it. Okay. And I must commend you on your use of a label maker, guys. Very good choice, not handwritten. If there was anything that you guys could do differently for your project, feel free to come on over, Justin, and chime in. What would you do differently? Anything at all that you can think of? Um, I got nothing. Do we actually you got nothing? Thinking about adding more components to widen the transmission line, um, and so that you can have different faults in different places and show different you know, circuit breakers opening up in different spots. To make it more complex. To make it more complex? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's not so much that I would do things differently, it's that there's more stuff that we could add. There's more functions, there's more things that we could program into the device itself to give it just a greater control over what happens and when it happens. And which faculty member did you work with as your faculty mentor? That was uh, Dr. Anamitra Pal. He has a lot of experience in power systems and uh, he was the closest to the, uh, what we were interested in, and this was the best choice. That's awesome. So it sounds like you guys could really expand on this. Definitely. Yeah. Cool. So you guys are all going to apply to the PhD program tomorrow? <laughs> uh, maybe the day after. <laughs> the day after? Oh, okay. Okay. Gotta you really th got to think about it. Think yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you taking the time. Congratulations on your project and congratulations on completing your degree. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thanks, guys. Move on to our next team. Move on. <laughs> oh, we're having a hard time? Okay. Okay. So, hello. Let me see your team name. ALU Design. Oh, I'm not looking at your name, Michelle. I'm looking at your poster. <laughs> ALU Design. What is that? Tell me more about that. Uh, it's a, like every chip that it has uh, ALU Design. And ALU Design is the thematic uh, logic unit. And we build a circuit. Uh, and uh, we use a cadence program okay. and uh, we build as you see like a two on bot and an add nor or uh, all the functions. Function. Okay, so ALU, I'm looking at what is ALU, a rhythmic logic unit uh -huh. and it's four circuits. Tell me why this is important, Khalid. 
Yeah, like and every every like single device, there's like ALU. It's like main major part in the microprocessor data path mm -hmm. that it's do the logic. I know it's like. Mm, What was that, Faisal? Uh, it chooses the functions. Like if they, you have uh, you have inputs and you need outputs, it, if you enter it, it will choose which functions to implement to give you the correct output. Okay. Yeah. That's what it does. Okay. So, what faculty member were you working with for your project? Uh, we were working with uh, Dr. Sue. He's in uh, he's in uh, a graduate uh, professor. Mm -hmm. We were working with him, and we were working with one of his. Uh, Uh, PhD student, mm -hmm. uh, they were helping us with our project. Okay. So, are you happy with what you were able to accomplish this semester? Do you feel like you've achieved what you wanted to achieve? Yeah, we're actually pretty happy. We initially we had uh, only two bits uh, input, but we doubled that and we made it uh, four bits input because we felt that we are capable of doing more, and that I think that's pretty good for us. That's interesting. So you started with two and then you doubled to four. Michelle, I'm going to switch over to you. When did you guys make that decision to double your work? It was like at the beginning of this semester. We make our project f flexible that we can change whenever we want it. We can add more function, more bits. So our project is not like one project and that's it. No, we made it uh, flexible. Like if we run out of time, we can do two bits. If not, we can add four, five, six, whatever we can go to. So that's why uh, when we made the decision at the beginning of this semester. Because we had the potential. We had the potential to do it. So why not? That's awesome. So you were ahead of schedule for your original design and your original project. Yeah. The faculty member was happy with it. You guys are happy with it. Yeah. And you said, why not? Let's try something new. Let's yeah. try to double it. Because we, we can do it. And why should not? Yeah. That's amazing, guys. I'm really proud of you because the time management can be really hard for a lot of teams because you think, oh, we're going to do this great and large project and then they run out of time. Yeah, so learning that is amazing. Yeah, because we first of all, we had an idea that making an out and layout, but we ran off out of time, so we didn't make a layout because it's a time consuming thing to do or to make. So with that, we stick with our four bits, like given, given like four inputs and getting four outputs, that's it. And it was, uh, we are really happy with what we uh, accomplished so far. Oh, that's amazing. So this work, is it going to continue to be used by the faculty and his student that helped you? Uh, if they want, yeah, sure. If Why they not? want? Yeah. Is it used in their research currently? Uh, not yet. No? Maybe, hopefully in the future. All right, make sure they cite your name on it. <laughs> Congratulations, guys. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to scoot this way. Our next. Okay, got it. Our next team is Team U.S. Electricity, and you look like a hybrid team. So we have an uh, online member, and we have you in person. Yeah. Tell us about the composition of your team. So uh, I'm the campus students, and the other two team members are connected with us online. Uh, that's Michael Thol and Joshua Lang. And my name is Falcon. Awesome, that's great that we have a hybrid team. Tell me about your project, Team U.S. Electricity. What does that mean? Yeah, so our project is called U.S. Electricity Generation Strategy Simulation. Uh, just a little bit of background of our projects. It basically all started by just realizing that uh, global climate change could be like greatly affected by the generation of electricity. Mm -hmm. So we thought that we want to create a simulation that uh, for people uh, so people can observe the manner in which energy resources are allocated and used. So Very interesting. So you've created this simulation and it looks like you have three models staying the course environmentally friendly and most economical. Why did you choose those three models? Uh, so so for staying in the co uh, staying the course, It's the, the ge electricity generation is based on the GDP and uh, population trend, so we just want to see if, if the, uh, the current trend is keep going. But for environmentally friendly, uh, we're trying to project the electricity generation. So for all of this, we project the electricity generation for the next 81 years from, from now on to 2100. So for Uh, 
uh, the sectors that is more environmentally friendly. So like we would uh, emphasize more on uh, uh, on wind and solar, whereas for the last one, the most economical is just uh, for for the um, for the sectors which are uh, has cost efficient in the in the long run. So for example, uh, so for example, uh, solar and wind. So solar and wind are is not is would be the best case for the most economical because their their LCOE or the levelized cost of electricity is not as expensive as the other sectors. Very interesting. And so you've worked with two members online. Let's see. I'm not sure if our mic will be able to pick them up. Hello, friends. <laughs> Don't know. Okay, let's try it. Okay, I'll get down here so I'm in your view. Um, so what was it like working in a hybrid team where you had in two online, one in person? How did you coordinate? We actually had uh, challenges with that because we originally had four students and one of them dropped out because of personal, you know, real life issues. And so we connected through Zoom and Google Hangouts and that type of thing. So mm -hmm. it uh, was a challenge, but not too bad. <laughs> and I'm sorry you guys aren't here today in person. I went around to all the tables and put candy on the tables, so you don't get to have any. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, thank you. so What? Thank you anyway. No problem. <laughs> thank you so much, guys. Congratulations on completing your project. Oh, we have another. What? Hey, let me know. Are we still live? Okay, can you switch over to We'll Be Right Back or to the online course? Switch, switch over to We'll Be Right Back. Team Maverick, thank you for joining me today to record your interview for um, the ECE Capstone Senior Design Demo Day. We've got quite the title now for this event. Um, can you please introduce yourselves to me? Uh, my name is Craig Clarkston. I'm Sam Porter. Roy Knapp. Brittany Floyd. Well, it's nice to meet you all. Um, can you please explain to me what you did because your team name is Team Maverick and I can't figure it out. <laughs> Tell me about your project. So the team name is because I work for a company called Moog in East Aurora, New York and um, they're developing a autonomous vehicle named Maverick. It's the uh -huh. Moog Autonomous Vehicle Integrated Circuits or something. I forget the C. But uh, the job of this vehicle is to go up and down apple orchards, scan trees, and determine which apples are ready to be harvested. Um, it'll also determine the health of the trees. We'll be able to spray fertilizers, things like that. Um, and the name of the vehicle, again, is Maverick. So that's where our team name came from. Uh, I, asking around that work, um, got in touch with some of the engineers on that team, and they offered to let us help on their project and we went forward from there. That's awesome. This is a really unique opportunity that you had access to through work because I don't think any of the other teams um, probably have done anything this large. Um, wow, can you tell me more about it and what it was like working with the company? 
Uh, well, I, I can't talk for everyone else, but I'm the only one local to the and that works for the company. So I was kind of the, the middleman for everything. Okay. Um, my work initially was extremely supportive, um, but as they ran into technical aspects or issues that they were having with the vehicle itself, we were mainly doing the software of trying to write a program that would actually identify the apples on the trees. So the help that we were hoping to get over the summer from them didn't materialize as much as we wish it would, um, but they are still very interested in our work. now. Their deadlines increased by maybe a year as to what they thought it would be. Um, but hopefully, like, we can keep in touch with everybody here and uh, either use what we've done or maybe try to continue doing what we are doing with the company. Okay, so your project kind of changed into software. Our correct? project was very fluid. In the beginning, it was kind of uh, you know, they left it up to us. They told us what were some of their challenges that they knew they were going to have down the road. And they asked us if there's any of these that we could tackle either um, uh, on our own path or kind of like parallel with them and see who came up with the better uh, solution to the problem. Um, so they gave us a lot of freedom in what we could do. And that was actually one of the challenges that we had as a team is you have this big scope of a project. Mm -hmm. and you have this wide open window on what you can do, how do you narrow it down? How do you pick something that we could accomplish in two semesters? Roughly what, nine months I think it was, or a little longer. Um, how, how do you narrow that down and come up with something that we could actually present for our capstone project? Very interesting. So Brittany, <laughs> would you say that you were able to accomplish what you had set out to accomplish as a team? Yeah, I think um, we did have a so we did struggle a lot with the um, scope creep, so to call. Um, we kind of started working on the identifying the apples thing, and then we sort of broadened it to what. Well, we had to make a decision: do we want to do just good or bad apples? Do we want um, you know these apples are good, but are they ripe? And so ultimately, we we had to make those decisions, and we kind of decided. Um, that it'd be the most useful to say, yes, this is a good apple, but also is it ready to be picked or not? So that was um, kind of one of the biggest challenges to just like sort of keep the scope defined and keep it from getting too big. And, but also trying to like push ourselves and make the most of the project. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately how did you come up with the programming or the software for it to determine it sees this apple versus this apple and it knows the difference? Um, I think Roy can better speak to that, but um, I know we used um, the color spectrum of the apple, just sort of drawing a line from one end of the apple to the other and um, using that range of colors to determine whether or not the apple was ripe or if it was even rotten and needed to be tossed out completely. Uh, so as far as software, um, machine learning is really picking up a ton of traction now and it's really accessible to everyone thanks to Google. So Google created TensorFlow, which is a very high level API that is very user friendly, um, pretty easy to learn and pick up and they just came out with their new TensorFlow version 2.0. So in the beginning, um, we just went with the open source, what was available and uh, we found out that the machine learning community is uh, uh, pretty, pretty wide and anyone nowadays can get access and start developing their own programs and software like this. Uh, you don't need to have a supercomputer. As we found out through the process, um, our home laptops couldn't actually, they didn't have the processing power to train the models to identify what we needed them to identify. I think the first run, my computer told me it would take 63 days to train it and then it crashed. Um, yeah, but uh, there's online, uh, well, you can remote into a GPU and you pay very, very low uh, price per hour. I think right now we pay like 50 cents an hour to to train our models online through a web, uh, website called Paperspace. And that was really the only cost to this project. Other than that, um, you know, we had, we had some hiccups along the way. We wanted to use TensorFlow 2.0 because it was brand new. 
Uh, we trained a couple models that were successful, but the, the problem was it was just identifying an image and classifying it. What we wanted, it couldn't actually pick out what the object was within the image. So we could have shown it a picture of a cat and it would have guessed if it was a good or bad apple. <laughs> it a high, yeah, it, it, it couldn't tell. Um, so in order to get a bounding box, um, there, the community support wasn't quite there because TensorFlow 2.0 was is relatively new and in order to get a working product that could take a video feed and give us an output uh we had to revert back to the highest version of tensorflow before they came out 2.0 it's like uh 1.15 and um it, it things got a little difficult because it's a little bit lower level api the training's a little bit different. Uh, it didn't all match up. So it was almost like halfway through when we felt like we were really getting traction, we had to start over. Um, but eventually we got to where we could get video to detect objects and we're, we're still not quite to where we could give this to Moog and they could just run it on their um, robot because we need it to run faster. We've got it working, but it's, the model that we trained is too big, and it we need a more simple model that will run uh, in real time. So that's where we're at right now. Interesting. And so you guys had a lot of struggles along the way, which I think is very good experience for working out in the field. Um, do you all currently work in a field related to electrical engineering? I am an engineer at Moog. Okay, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in your jobs, have you ever experienced anything like this before? Yeah, definitely. Um, it, there's always shifting timelines and at work. Normally, there's like management that absorbs all of that and figures out the schedule. So, it's a little bit different playing both roles here. That definitely makes it easier at work when, you know, someone just tells you what to do. But yeah, no, definitely. This is an, a perfect example of how the workforce has been in my experience. I would say one of the nice things for me is uh, my company has branches all over the world. So I'm sometimes working with another team and actually we have a branch in New Mexico and Virginia. And sometimes I'm always on conference calls like this trying to solve a problem. And working with these guys, it was much the same way. You know, we try to schedule team meetings once a week or twice a week as needed. Um, we always try to set times to work together uh, to try to work out any issues that we were having. And so working in an online team, because you are all online, I'm assuming you guys aren't just like down the street from each other. You guys are states away. You're in different time zones. Did you have any issues navigating that? I don't think we really did. I mean, you know, using like Google Hangouts and using um, uh, like the shared drive that we had on Google, uh, you know, we were constantly editing our papers together. Um, we would post something, have everyone else read it, edit it, stuff like that. Um, I think maybe 10 years ago, we would have had a really hard time, but as technology has like gotten more advanced, um, it wasn't too challenging, especially for our project. I think if we had to build something that was more hands-on, that might have been uh, more of an issue, but I, I think that's one of the reasons why this project actually worked in our benefit. If there's anything that you guys could do differently, what would you do if you had all the time and all the money in the world to <laughs> work on your project more? Is there anything that you would do differently? I mean, outsource it to India. What? Outsource it to India. <laughs> yeah, time and money are the two limiting factors. If we had all the time and money in the world, we would have like a freaking <laughs> whole, the whole car would be in my room right now. It'd be done. <laughs> if, um, if I had the time and the money, I would definitely have been out at the orchard that Moog is working with. Um, it would have been easier to create a data set. So another huge issue that we ran into was oh, we were told that we would be given all the images and they would already be classified and we didn't get that information so we had to construct our own data set um, mm -hmm. off of open source uh, libraries and we had to painstakingly go through thousands and thousands of images um, map the 
mean value of the color space data, because that's how we eventually classified the data into what was a good apple, what was the most valuable apple, and then we had to go into each image and box individually each apple on each image so that this could all be ran through and trained. So that was the time consuming part. Um, I would just like to do it in the environment that the robot's already gonna be in and get some video feed from there. And I think that would have made a huge difference um, in actual use of this because then every image would have been on a tree in the correct environment and I think it would have been a little better. Uh, and also we were told by Moog that the market research showed that the color of an apple really dictates its value and not necessarily how fresh it is. And that these processing plants, uh, they run it through their machine and it takes a bunch of pictures and tells you if it's a 35 cent or a five cent apple. And um, I was hoping that we could just get a hold of that data that that machine uses to determine the value of the apple so we could just use that information in training our model. But um, had I been actually working on this as a job and making money for it, uh, that's where I would be if I was leading the project. I would be at the processing plant getting that data from them, taking the pictures and videos on the actual orchard we're gonna work this thing on. Um, and I guarantee uh, it, it would, like Sam said, it would be tangible. We'd be touching it right now, it'd be out there working. But, um, you know, we all got our full-time jobs, full-time families and other right. things. Well, thank you so much for meeting with me today, everyone. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry that you had such struggles, but I'm really proud that you were able to overcome them and find different routes, because that is one of the main purposes of having the capstone event, is to teach you that, you know, in life, this is gonna happen. And it sounds like luckily you guys have already had some experience in those situations, so you were able to handle it well. Yeah, luckily other projects have had time issues and stuff in, in my real job, yeah, luckily. <laughs> Yeah. Well, congratulations on completing your project and completing your degree. Thank you Thank for you. taking the time to meet with me, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Team AutoClaude. Thank you for joining me today for your interview. Can you please introduce yourselves? Go ahead, Patricia. Uh, my name is Patricio Del Castillo. Uh, I'm from uh, Texas, uh, around the uh, DFW area. Uh, of course, doing electrical engineering. Um, my background is uh, nuclear energy and instrumentation and controls. Go ahead, Rodrigo. Yeah, so my name is Rodrigo. I'm also from Texas. I'm about uh, 20 miles away from Patricio. Um, you know, we're both graduating this, uh, this year. Um, my background is uh, military. I've been serving for more than eight years now, and um, I'm separating here soon. Um, uh, that's pretty much it. Awesome, that's so cool that you guys happen to be close. Do you, did you meet up to do any of your project? We, we did. did. Oh, you're so lucky. None of the other teams <laughs> can do that. <laughs> yeah. I think in the beginning we actually uh, kind of talk to each other and like, hey, you, you probably live really close to me. Do you want to like kind of be in the same team? That way it becomes easier if we need to like work together, so. Good strategy. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell me what AutoQuad is and what you did for your project. You want to start it off, Rodrigo? Yeah, so our, uh, so AutoQuad, our project is uh, called uh, quadcopter position control and our main objective is to replace the traditional um, you know joystick to um, using a single camera and that that allows us to control the drone using just that um, so we uh, we programmed it using OpenCV um, Python and uh, we built a prototype that allows us to uh, uh, to control the drone using just a single um, camera you want you want to add anything to it, uh, Patricio? Um, no, I mean, uh, as you said, we used OpenCV. A lot of the the things that we uh, we went off uh, we we learned from existing kind of technologies that had uh, not something similar, but something uh, like a baseline of what uh, we were trying to achieve. So uh, it was a, a little bit of trial and error, but we um, kind of created our own. 
uh, scripts and stuff based on uh, other individuals, uh, um, what they were working on. They weren't exactly working on what we were working on, but uh, we we definitely got inspired by a lot of individuals that are, are currently uh, diving really deep into uh, uh, machine learning and uh, OpenCV uh, video processing uh, technologies. Very interesting. And so your, it would be controlled by a camera? That's right. Yes. Okay. So if I, how would that work? Where if you have your drone and you have your camera, what movements would you do in order to make the drone fly? So our, um, so our prototype. Um, so, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. So our prototype is, uh, we built two prototype configurations. Uh, one is arm uh, worn. So we, we're wearing, um, kind of like a, uh, a device and it's got the camera and as we move around uh, the, ca the drone follows it. Um, uh. so, so our basic concept is to keep that drone at the center of that camera, uh, camera view at all times. So as you move the camera, the, uh, you know, the drone follows it. Okay. And so what are the real life applications for this? I mean, there's there's multiple applications. You can do go uh, down the entertainment route, and you can have it as a, a toy, right? But I mean, there's other applications as well. You can have uh, like a uh, a camera based uh, drone for off a tank or something for uh, air support or something like that, where maybe um, you don't maybe there's a lot of interference uh, where you can't get radio frequency, but you can get line of sight uh, on certain things. Um, it, I mean, there's, there's some technologies where we've seen where you can actually, um, access another drone, you know, by visual. So like, uh, I think Rodrigo was able to see this somewhere where, uh, someone was able to hack someone else's drone just by, uh, having a line of sight on it and kind of, yeah, I don't know. You know the details about that? Rodrigo? Yeah. So so basically, the one uh, one uh, one of the projects that we um, I saw before was uh, this um, this person was able to to ma manipulate the signal of other drones around the area where his drone was and being able to control those drones. So basically, you know, take over the controls and he could pretty much get those drones. <laughs> wow, that is interesting. Yeah. So your project is intentional control over drones via line of sight. That's right. Not, <laughs> not what that guy did. <laughs> yes. Right. yes. Very interesting. And so you two are online and you have an in-person team member um, that I'll be speaking to as well. What was it like having a hybrid team? It was very challenging because one is the communication and the time difference. Um, and we all work different schedules. So Kyla is a night shift and both of uh, Patricia works really long hours and mine is a little bit more flexible. So we had to really um, schedule the time and become, you know, be smart about our, uh, you know, our communication and you know, uh, uh, relaying information to one another that we were not re redoing um, experiments that one of us have already done. Yeah, th there was a uh, a lot of uh, there was a lot of uh, documentation of you know what each one was doing and trying to keep track of everything that uh, each one was researching. As as uh, Rodrigo says, you know we were trying not to do any overlap, but we also uh, very early on wanted to have some form of accountability. You know, so we were, you know like Rodrigo said, we all had different schedules and uh, different uh, things that came in uh, uh, during the time that we were doing the project. I, Rodrigo had a child. Um, you know, I, 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 there was days where uh, I had some crazy work going on. So uh, it, it kind of kept us on track. We, we, we made a, a, like a diary of all of our uh, advances, all the things that we were researching. And it kind of you know, when one of us would falter or something like that, or one of us were, you know, dragging behind uh, the other two of kind of like, uh, hey, everything all right? So it was, that was like, 
even though it's extra things that we had to do, it, it uh, really streamlined uh, the ability for us to, to, to get things done. Very good. Having that accountability is something that is very hard for some people to learn. So I think being in a hybrid team um, or even just an online team kind of forces that upon you if you've never had that experience before. Have either of you had that experience before in real life situations or previous jobs? Uh, I'm, go, go ahead, ahead Patricia. No, go ahead. Well, <laughs> but I, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, like I said, I work in the nuclear industry, so there's a lot of things that we have to document and there's a lot of accountability here. A lot of, uh, you know, if you say you're gonna do something, then a lot of people are depending on you to actually do that one thing um so yeah i mean as far as a, a project with other individuals online no but uh having that that sense of accountability yes uh, it's kind of day in and day out of my job uh, similar to mine because uh you know being in the military you you really have to be you know accountable and responsible for everything that you do especially in you know we deal with mission critical uh you know, uh, tasks, um, especially on deployment. So, you know, the, the military kind of uh, thought me uh, you, uh, to become accountable and responsible at early age. And, and it's, a, it's the same with, uh, with Kyle, right? He, he also served. Yes. Yeah, so Kyle it was also in the Navy for four years. And um, he, uh, you know, he separated after uh, the first enlistment and moved on. Very interesting. If there anything that you could do differently for this project, what would you do? <laughs> uh, you you want to start it off, Rodrigo? <laughs> so, uh, do differently. I think um, not different, but um, improve it more, right? Because there's always room for improvement. So I think we built a very good uh, fundamentals of you know, being able to control a drone using a camera, which in our knowledge has never been done before. Um, so it, I think what we've done so far is I wouldn't change anything, right? So I would just continually uh, improve it. And with that, we can in improve the tracking system. There are, you know, I can go on and on, on, you know, how to improve this, but with, with our time uh, in for it, 488 and 489, I think we've maximized the potentials of this, uh, this project. I, I, I agree with Rodrigo. Um, I mean, if we were to redo this uh, project exactly as it is, I think we've reached uh, uh, the limitations or, or really close to the limitations of what we can achieve. Now, if, if we're able to have a, a f more freedom, specifically with like the processor and stuff like that, I think we would have actually delved into using some other kind of processor because we could go into more advanced, uh, you know, technologies, uh, machine learning kind of things where we can actually program it to uh, identify the drone in, by a different manner than the manner that we, we took as an approach. Uh, and I feel that would probably um, bring uh, that next step of evolution, you know, towards this project. But no, yeah, if, if we were to keep everything the same, uh, it would be very difficult to, to see where we can find improvements. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today and congratulations on completing your project and your degrees. All thank right, you. thank you. Thanks guys, have a great day. You too. Right, you too. Bye -bye. Hi 5G team, thank you so much for meeting with me today. Our next team is Photovoltaic Backup System. Can you please introduce yourselves to me? Uh, my name is Nathaniel Levis. Uh, my name is David Colorado. My name is Joe Chambers. And online we have Steven Feemster. Hi Steven. <laughs> Can you please tell me about your project? Sure. Who would like to go, Joe? Would. Okay. I'm gonna um, switch to this side. All right. So this is uh, this is what we call the PVB or the photovoltaic backup system. Uh, what this is is normally with a residential uh, photovoltaic system, what you have is something called a grid tie inverter. 
What this does is it converts the DC from a solar panel into AC that you can use in your home. If, if the grid goes down, however, this thing will turn off. So you might have invested $20,000 in a photovoltaic system that during a power out outage doesn't work. And so what our system does is it, is it uh, allows you to trick the grid tie inverter into thinking it's still on the grid. So if there's an extended power outage, you can still use your, your solar panels to produce power for your home. Um, you can use that to power whatever you want, including charging batteries for you know, a, a backup system. Um, and it's actually kind of difficult to trick a grid tie inverter into doing that, which is why this thing is so big and has so many different components. Does it work? Yeah, it does. Press the button, David. Uh, we have to go through like <laughs> like a whole chain of commands too. So. Okay, so there's a whole chain of commands. Tell me, tell me about them as we do them. Oh, um, so we're gonna drop the grid. Okay. We're gonna drop the grid. Uh, I, I'm we're really going dark. There's a power, outage. power outage. Okay. So grid is off. Grid is off. Okay. The driver is on. Okay. Yeah. So the driver is on now, right? Uh-huh. All right. Okay, so now yes, sir. we are running off of battery right now, and this is sending out AC or alternating current. We still have power. Okay. Okay. So what we're what we're doing now is this is our solar panel and I've just given it power. This will wait one minute and then turn on. So we're waiting for this to recognize that the grid has come back on and it's gonna start producing power. So if you're not, you've got a 30 second question while we wait for this. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna be waiting 30 seconds. So Joe and Steven are online team members and Joe drove from Utah today. Thank you for joining us. Steven, we're sorry you couldn't be here, um, but we appreciate your participation online. Here we go. So if you watch the current right here, you'll see that the grid tie inverter will be taking up the balance of the power in a few seconds. Yep, there we go. And so now we are literally running off of our quote unquote solar panel, producing AC power, and we're disconnected from the grid. So very cool. Yep. That's a great demonstration, guys. I like it a lot. How much did all of this cost, <laughs> Nathaniel? It cost a lot of money. How much money? We don't have an exact total. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. So like we're like a uh, like hybrid team. Uh -huh. So like for some of us, we built our own testing systems, and so like I spent like 180 for mine, but then Joe he built this whole thing, so he spent a lot more. So. Yeah. yeah, so what you don't see here is that since we were a hybrid team, David and I, um, obviously we didn't have access to all of this. So we actually built multiples of the same components so that we can test them individually. And then whenever the project came together, um, we kind of all threw it all together, came out with our final product. Yeah. And uh, Joe was nice enough to drive it all the way down here and um, we still have the extra components. We actually had to use some of them in testing, you know, went through components, um, burned up a few of them. <laughs> and uh, so it's kind of, it kind of worked out that we had spares. Um, but yeah. if we were a, if we were an all in-person team, we might've spent a little less money on it, but- A little less time. A little and less a little time. Easier, so. yeah. yeah. And so, so the last step here that I'll show you is if the grid comes back on, you can see it shuts down. And then a few seconds later, the house comes back onto the grid. Very cool. Well, congratulations, guys. This is a great project. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day and talking to everyone. And congratulations on earning your degrees. Thank you. Have a great day, guys. Hello. Are you guys ready? So this is the FPGA and machine learning team handwritten number detection application. That is a long title. Um,
Kai, can you yeah. please explain what your project is to me? So uh, our main pro uh, project is uh, plug the FPGA to recognize a handwritten digit from zero to nine, the single digit. And um, yeah, if you want to try that. I can try it? Yeah. I just drew a zero here. And then, let's see, so if, okay. So you drew a zero on your phone. We have a zero here, and if we hold this in front of the camera, Zach clicks the green button. If I can get this lined up here, let's hope that we get, is that good? Let's see, hopefully we get a zero. Okay, so it detected the zero. Yep, so the idea here, uh, the idea here, is to implement a machine learning algorithm on an FPGA and to uh, basically showcase that something like this is possible on one of our trainer boards. Uh, this is only like a $60 board. Um, commonly, if you were going to use FPGAs in uh, industry, these boards would be upwards of like $5,000 or so. Um, and the idea here is to uh, showcase the speed of the board. Um, down here we have our infographic with the uh, timing diagrams on the FPGA to do these calculations, we, it only took 8.04 microseconds, whereas on a high-end CPU, uh, it took upwards of 213 microseconds. So we got about 26 times the speed by using the uh, FPGA. That's really impressive. So you're showing that you are able to do the same thing that a very expensive board is able to do on a cheaper board? Yes, pretty much. So um, another application of this would be uh, commonly done in finance. Um, a lot of these are used to uh, buy and sell stocks, and a lot of that is timing. You've got to be as fast as possible. First one there to buy it gets to buy it. So um, they would use a much uh, more uh, resource-intensive board to do these uh, calculations on. But we wanted, to see, we wanted to see if it was possible to do on these training boards, and we got it to work. That's very interesting. So, which faculty member did you work with, Zachary? We worked with uh, David Ali and Dr. Harden. He was just here. Was he happy with your project, Dr. Yeah. Ali was? I think so, yeah. You think so? <laughs> yeah. I hope so. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. So, you mentioned finance yes. implications. Um, what other real world applicability is there for this project? So, really, any kind of uh, any, anything that requires like instant feedback. To, like, if like, milliseconds matter, mm -hmm. so possible, possible military applications or all other fields, anytime you need, just you need, you need an answer quick just so you can start acting on that. Very interesting. Well, congratulations, guys. That's fantastic. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Hello. You guys are up. Come join me. <laughs> oh, this is an interesting name tag. Um, <laughs> Come on up, come join me. Get in my space. So you guys are light cube cubestat. Right. Light cube cube cubestat. Light cube. cube. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your project. So light cube is developing a small spacecraft. Uh, right now, behind us, and we're bringing up at <gasps> this moment. Ooh. This is an engineer model of the spacecraft. Uh, this is the actual size. Most spacecraft are the size of a school bus or a large truck, but not this one. This is pretty small. And this is called a CubeSat, and this is a center form factor. But this is an educational mission. We want to inspire people to learn more about space, learn more about engineering. So we developed this mission where everybody can get a simple radio. Uh, Simon, can you pull it up? Uh, this simple radio, they can point it up to the sky when the spacecraft is flying over, over them. They can send a command, simple command, and the spacecraft will flash. It will produce a very high intensity light, very strong enough where you could see it all the way from space and be one of the brightest objects in the night sky. So it has a very, very high intensity light. <laughs> and yeah, we, we're not going to flash it right now because it, it's a bit too much. It can blind people at such close intensity. <laughs> but um, we brought the model for, to show everybody. Uh, that we built. And it works. We have actually submitted a proposal to NASA uh, as of November of this year, and it's on, currently under consideration for launch. We're going to learn in February if it's going to be launched to the International Space Station and then deployed from there. That is so cool. Okay, so this is just a model of it, um, but it actually works. You actually did it. You submitted it to NASA. Right. Did any of you submit bills for eye surgery to NASA? <laughs> Not no. Yet. <laughs> not, not yet? Not yet. No. We're going to wait for the long-term effects of this? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And I heard a rumor that you guys spent about $3,000 yeah. 
on yeah. this project? Well worth three thousand. Well worth. Tell me what the components were. What was the costliest component? So the main cost would be the solar panels, the triple junction uh, gallium arsenide solar panels. They were the main bulk of the cost, costing around eight hundred dollars. These are high efficiency solar panels that we need for our spacecraft because power is essential. They're so little, it's scary. Are yes. they normally this little? Um, no, <laughs> we, ha we got them at a discount. These are Trisol X solar wings. Um, these are essentially the tips of the main solar cells that would be used on conventional space grade solar panels that you would use at Northrop or General Dynamics. So we got them at a discount. Very cool. So were you guys working with um, any companies or were you working with the Space Exploration School for any of your projects? It's completely separate. Com completely separate? Yeah. We, we work with Danny Jacobs. Is he part of... Uh, yeah, we, we have a mentor from the school. Dan that. Jacobs? Yeah. yeah, Nanny Jacobs from the School of Earth and Space Exploration. Uh, we've been partnered with them to get some ad um, essentially advice on how to build a spacecraft successfully since uh, they, that school uh, has launched several spacecraft similar to this one. Mm -hmm. Very cool, you guys. And so I saw that you are also a Palais Senior Design Prize nominee. For those of you who are watching that don't know, Dr. Palais is our graduate program chair and one of our faculty members. And every year he donates $500 to be split across teams that win um, this and you get a fancy lunch at the University Club with Dr. Palais and a faculty member. Um, teams self-nominate, so it's completely up to the teams. And there are secret judges milling about this room judging you as we speak um, and as you speak as well so congratulations this is fantastic I would say it's a great contender to be a winner for the project congratulations guys I would say you guys are also the winner so far of highest cost and potential long-term health damages so good job <laughs> I, will say I learned a lot from this project so th this project has probably been one of the most uh, fruitful of knowledge things I've done in my entire engineering experience so. I'm really glad to hear that. Congratulations, guys. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, you're up. Hello, Dr. Holly. <laughs> this is a really interesting project here. Where they, are, they have built a solar oven to cook your chicken. <laughs> Turkey for Thanksgiving. And you can guide these or Fresnel lenses that will focus the light from the sun down to the center, but of course as the sun moves, that beam of light shifts, and it will, has automatic control algorithm to keep the focus right there on the chicken, so, or the turkey, so you get a really good Thanksgiving meal. Congratulations guys, great team. Be sure to thank one of your most important team members. <laughs> So this team is development of modular solar thermal collector control system. Mike, can you tell me about your project? Anything that Dr. Ali didn't cover? Thank you. So he covered most of it, but um, we reached out uh, through the help of uh, Zach Holman there to get in contact with someone, a startup in uh, California that they're focusing on uh, solar thermal collectors, and they were having a little issues with their control systems. So it takes. It took originally about three hours for it to find the sun, and we were able to reduce it down to about 24 minutes. Uh, yeah, and we we ended up coming up with some of our own little code that we use with these Arduinos here. And uh, if you look at the screen, you can see how it actually works. We have it in demonstration mode, so people can play around with it, of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> So I think for sure Dr. Ali would buy this because it sounds like he's hungry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think he could use some food. <laughs> it's a really nice turkey oven. That's so cool. I want to play around with it while you talk. Um, Whitney, can you tell me how much this all cost? And take the mic and speak right into it. Okay. The budget for this was right around $1,000. And it required us to purchase um, two lenses that were specially made. Uh, Risley Prism Fresnelized lenses, and uh, yeah, we built. We had this fabricated, and we built it up, and it came in right around a thousand dollars. So, so the goal is for me to get the light on the center. Yeah. Right, right. I'm failing, oh, you guys. Ah. So, 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 so use the diagonal. Use the diagonal. diagonal? Ah, closer, closer. Yeah. Not gonna happen. We'll so, see. Oh. Is up and down, so that's the 
Okay. So I was just explaining that one of the discs is X and the other disc is Y axis, which is explains why going back and forth in one direction doesn't help. Yeah. But I want to go diagonal. Oh. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. So. We went ahead and found two focal points on the top lens and we put arrows on it. So if you have that directed at the uh, the light source, ideally the sun, uh, then the bottom bottom light or the bottom disc would just need to be rotated for it to be able to be centered um, on the photoresistor that we have set up down there. Yep, and now you're going to want to do the second one. You, Oh, nope. There you go. Almost. Now tilt the top one a little bit. All right. Well, congratulations. Great project. If there's anything that you guys could do differently, what would you do? <laughs> well, I guess one of the best part, one of the uh, things that we were looking for is to try to get the sensors come from the top as opposed to from the bottom, because when the sun does come and focus there, it's, it'll be much more intense than this light here, so it would kill our sensors right away. So if anything we can do, we would you know, try to aim the, the, a different type of sensor coming from the top. And also, in the future, this could be more like an AI um, type of project where you know, it, it can create its own algorithm and eventually find the sun and just keep you know, finding it over and over by itself. So. Great project, you guys. Congratulations. It's really awesome. Good day. Hi guys. Your project name is Marine Acoustics and I see we also have an online team member. Hello friend. Can you please tell me about your project? Uh, we produced a piece of equipment that can detect motion in uh, given areas and play uh, marine predator noises to deter uh, marine animals from specific areas. So they cannot damage the uh, fishing nets and the boats. They cannot jump in the boats. Uh, by uh, playing uh, predator noises on the speakers. Okay. Yeah. So your project is to help save animals by using acoustic noises underwater so they can avoid fishing nets and boats and everything. That's amazing. Have you tested this? Um, well, in the way we haven't really tested it in the field, we just only have a prototype that plays the noise if it detects um, motion, basically. <laughs> and we have it playing predator noises, uh, basically from uh, audio file on SD card. So that's why we have one. How do you decide which noises to play? Uh, we uh, concentrated on the predator, so the sea lions and the other animals scare from the uh, the, the sharks and the uh, orbs. That's why we chose the uh, predator noises, so they can scare. That is very interesting. And so you have one online team member and you are both in-person students. What was it like working um, with someone remotely? Did you have any struggles with that? And I'm sorry, we won't be able to get the audio to hear you. <laughs> it's kind of loud in here. Here, go ahead and tell me about the struggles that you had. So, well, uh, just in terms of get, like being able to meet together, we, also, we had to find a time frame which we could all meet together especially with our project mentors that was a challenge but we in the end we were still able to work a lot of things out and as well as communicate with each other effectively so it was still all right that's fantastic and which faculty did you work with dr. Blaine Christian I know she's very busy and I know it can be kind of hard to get into her schedule were you guys trying to constantly work around that were you going to her team meetings we have a meeting every week, uh, a Zoom meeting online, because we have an online student and she's kind of busy. Uh, she was great. She, we learned a lot of, uh, from uh, the uh, professor, Jennifer Blaine. That's awesome. Well, congratulations, guys. Great project with real world applicability. That's awesome. Good job. You better watch out, classes. Hello guys, so this is load carrying model Segway. Um, so please tell me that this is a Segway that will deliver me coffee. It looks like it's set up to do this. You knew I was gonna be here today. You win, good job. 
Awesome. <laughs> Tell me about your project. So we have a self-balancing robot. Uh, the objective of it is to uh, deliver, as you can see, coffee. As, uh, as, yeah, the a size of a cup of coffee to the desired location, and uh, yeah, um, that's the objective of the project is to deliver a load in general. Very cool. And so you've made a working model here. It looks 3D printed. Awesome. Did you print that here at the ASU like print labs? Yes, we actually did use the ASU print labs here for it. Awesome. Does it work? Does it work? <laughs> yes. Could we send it over there to get me coffee? Oh, okay. I think we, no, I'm not going to make you do that. I won't make you do that. I won't make you do that. That would require coordination and someone have to pour the coffee and that's just too much. Um, but you have it set up. Can we make it roll like a little bit? You just push it? Yeah. Jake. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we also have a joystick set up so that we can actually uh, send it to go forwards or backwards. But with the amount of space we have here, I don't really trust that it won't, uh, won't go off the table. That's very cool. So I understand the purpose of it is just a coffee delivery maker, but I think that there's probably some bigger real world things that this could help. Um, Yasar, can you tell me more about what else you could do with this project? Um, so we can use it in so many applications, like for example how Amazon is using these robotics into getting the packages from different places to another. Mm -hmm. And so with this robot, it's that, that's just a prototype, but um, the idea of it, it can deliver packages um, you know, so various locations with this controller over here. And it can get more than a, a cup of coffee, of course. <laughs> so, yeah. So this model, what are the weight um, limitations for it? Um, what do you mean by limitations? How, like, how much weight could it carry? Um, so it varies, it depends. If it's vertically, like if it's a cup of coffee or um, a water bottle, it would, it would carry up to... I would say 300 grams, and then it would be unstable um, over 500 grams, and it would isolate between 300 and 500 grams. But below 300, it would be stable and able to deliver anywhere. And it varies. If it's um, if it's the load is placed um, horizontally, it would be able to carry it to up to maybe more than 500. Oh, okay. So the distribution of the load is important for this. That's good to know. Very cool, you guys. Anything else that you would have changed in this project if you had like all of the time in the world? I think future steps that we could do is having more powerful motors because uh, that allow us to have more torque, which means we could be able to carry more load. Uh, and then also uh, just cleaning some things up as well, cleaning up our codes, that way making additional changes to be easier and cleaning up some of the wiring on the inside so that way troubleshooting and uh, retesting things is easier. Very cool. Congratulations, guys. Great job. Thank you. I'm going to try and figure out how to go over here. Let's see. Okay. We're going to this team? Okay, cool, no problem. I'll be back for you later. Didn't want to trip. <laughs> Hello. Hey guys, whose team is this? Your team, are you ready? Yeah, we're ready. Go to the next team.
Off with what? All right, we're live. We're live? Okay. So this team is the Efficient GPS and Vehicle Tracking Applications team. Yeah. Can you please tell me what your project's about? Um, uh, we can start off with Mohammed. He kind of Mohammed will tell us. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, uh, our project uh, is to, to, uh, to uh, we want to to have a better understanding a real world driving scenario in a roadway system and you can continue with it because yeah absolutely that's okay Mohammed great job can you tell me more about your project guys yeah so uh, we basically wanted to um, get a better understanding on uh, different uh, driving scenarios and uh, real world uh, roadway systems and uh, basically we wanted to build on uh, GPS uh, it's uh, low cost and a standalone uh, we started off with um, the GPS ultimate breakout over here on the table uh, that's our GPS and we built a little set for it, a box to keep it intact and uh, so it doesn't fall off and uh, run around. We used a, a USB to TTL converter so we can connect it to a laptop and uh, we can start it in collecting data. Um, if you want to see more about the visualizations um, that we use to study more and learn more about this, I can show you right here, excuse me. Uh, right here we collected data on an urban city and right here it's on, on a highway and uh, we can show different kind of attribution. So the first one is uh, speed, the second one, uh, I'm sorry, the first one is altitude, the second one is speed right there. Oh. Uh, yeah, it starts off with blue, that means low speed, and the red is high speed. Um, third one is heading, northwest, east, the direction of where we're going. And the last one is the number of satellites we're using at any given moment. Ooh. So um, the red one means we were using uh, more satellites. Uh, from the data we collected, it looked like we were collecting around 11 to 13 satellites at, at this point of area right there. 11 to 13 satellites. Now, I don't understand why that's important, but you mentioned it, so I feel like it's important. Uh -huh. Can you tell me why that number of satellites is important? Yeah, because in some areas we like had a poor uh, connection with the GPS. Mm -hmm. So uh, this satellites with uh, the, uh, the sensors are working to... Uh, I create the, the values here. We also uh, happy to work with uh, the GPS tracking system because we know a lot uh, for uh, doing the, the GPS system. Uh, we add a lot of features such as the 3D map. It shows the, the mountains and shows uh, uh, the roads also. So yeah, that, that's it. Very interesting. So which faculty did you work with? You worked with Dr. Yu and then his PhD student, Todd. Very cool. So did you work in his group? Yeah, yes, we yeah, we did. Uh, we worked in the lab uh, area that was given to us by Dr. Hugman Yu and Todd. That's awesome. I'm working with Dr. Hugman. Um, he's a great professor and Todd also. I wish him the best luck in his uh, PhD. Uh, he was very helpful with our project. That's great. Mohammed, will you tell me what your favorite part of this project was? It's uh, that we make the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the smallest G uh, GPS uh, uh, in the world. You uh, made the smallest GPS yeah, in the world? Yeah, I feel I, like you guys should have started with that. What? I feel like you should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> also, that we can show the the altitude and the uh, and the speed. Congratulations. That's amazing. Great job, guys. Have a fun day. Hey. Hello, Photonic Assisted Frequency Conversion Team. Oh, man, you guys, the names just get more complicated as we go. I feel like this was intentional to mess me up. <laughs> Arthur, can you tell me about your project? Uh, sure. So uh, our project is over um, Photonic Assisted Frequency Conversion. Um, the objective, uh, so our sponsors are General Dynamics, and they ask us to work on a project to uh, provide a proof of concept for uh, taking an optical signal and doing some optical mixing to increase the bandwidth. And so um, we have you know, data collection and some other things that we did, but um, that's pretty much the core of the project. That's very cool. And were all the materials donated for this project by General Dynamics? Yes, not donated. Not donated? Well, used? Yes, yeah. Okay. Course, yeah. 
So we have, uh, well, all the parts that are on that board right there, those are purchased um, within our budget. Okay. But then all the lab equipment is from General Dynamics, yes. And so what was it like working with a company? Because I feel like most of the teams here just work just within themselves, maybe with some faculty. So you guys have had a unique experience of working with industry partners. What was that like? I think it was great. It was great to get some industry experience and it was great to work with like hands-on lab equipment and we learned a lot about design process and budgeting process and how to how things work mm -hmm. in real life. So yeah. That's fantastic. And so Breton, would it be possible to demonstrate anything? Um yeah I could we'd have to zoom in here. Okay, well, let's give it a shot. Let's see if we can do it. Let's first um, let's first talk about how these these are key components to our system. These are uh, mock sender interfer or modulators, sorry. Um, and so, if we look at this this uh, little simulation here, what's happening is this is a lithium neobate crystal. Sorry about the ads. <coughs> um, and a laser comes through this this system, and it's kind of split up into two paths. And then by changing a signal that you apply to one path, it slows down essentially, or, or speeds up um, uh, this side of things. It comes back together, um, and then you have some sort of modulation. And so what's happening is we have, um, we have this system, and then we're applying an RF signal to it. Um, so it's essentially adding or super, superimposing the RF signal to, um, to the laser, right? And then so we're combining that with a, another locally generated signal, um, sending it to a photodiode. Um, that converts it to electrical signals, and then um, and that, and that, that's what you'll see here. So if we look at the spectrum analyzer, <clears throat> you can see um, we've got our, this is a two gigahertz um, RF signal simulated, and then our locally generated signal, three gigahertz. Um, and then what that, that produces a, a one gigahertz intermediate frequency, the difference of those signals, as well as the sum of those signals over here, and some other noise and spurious signals. And so if you put a filter at the end of that, you can really just kind of focus on any specific aspect of, depending on what you're trying to find, um, any specific aspect of that. Um, and then by adjusting, so these are our power supplies um, and they're biasing these mock center modulators. If you adjust those, uh, the power um, or the voltage applied to that, you can, you can change also the, the power levels that you're getting out here in a way. So. Yeah. Very I don't know if that cool. Your question. I'm sure it did. <laughs> I'm not an electrical engineer. Okay. Um, that's fine. So, General Dynamics. You guys worked closely with them on okay. this. Are they happy with what you've done? Very happy. Did they offer you jobs? Yeah. Yes. We had, yeah, we had. You don't yeah, lie, had, don't lie we, to me right now. We had. We had. We had. We had, we had interviews. We, had, we. We just had interviews. So. Yep. Very good. Well, congratulations, guys. This is a great project. I'm glad that your company was happy with it, um, and we wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> so, obviously, you did something with photovoltaic systems okay. at Monument Valley. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great yes. job, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Describe more about your project. So our project was inspired because in 2014, a fo- photovoltaic system was set up in Monument Valley for Miss uh, Effie Yossi to do jewelry and other crafts because she uh, is off the grid and there was no, uh, there's no, electricity, no, there's no there. electricity there. And so after this photovoltaic system was set up, there's been incremental problems throughout. And so our mentor, Dr. Stephen Goodnick, wanted a, uh, monitoring. Measure, a monitoring and measuring system that can alert uh, the admin of potential problems. So basically, this is really cool. I did not expect that from the title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically, what happens is if it goes over a certain amount of voltage, it's going to send out a text message warning to our professor, our mentor, uh, Professor Stephen Goodnick. If it goes below a certain value of voltage, then it's going to also send him a low voltage warning as well. And so this is all automated. Um, nobody has to be there to do this because obviously we won't be there in that house. Um, so we definitely have high hopes for this, but um, it's still pretty new. It's a very new product. I mean, I think it just came out this year. Um, so uh, we programmed it. We got set up to how we want it to work, at least for the time being. And um, I guess we're just going to try and demo it for you guys. If Hopefully it'll send a text message again. Well, you just earlier. showed me that it did, yeah, so, so I think it works. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so basically, like, right now what we have it set up at is um, anything below 10 volts, it's going to show a low voltage warning. Anything above 20 volts, it's going to show a high voltage warning. And it's just like for demo purposes only, the actual values are going to be different inside the house. Mm-hmm. Uh, but honestly, this uh, power supply only goes up to 25 volts to begin with, so... Um, Give it a shot. Yeah, let's yeah. go ahead and try it out. Okay, that's good. Oh, there you go. So low voltage, 9.56. So that's how it works. And then if we go high voltage, past 20. Um, <laughs> might take a minute. It, yeah, yeah. It, it'll take some time. But and so, I mean, at least it works. It's it does. This is really and there's there's the notification right there. So this is really important to ensure that people who are relying on photovoltaic systems have consistent power and can be prepared adequately mm-hmm. when you know there's surges or they lose power. Yeah, when they lose power. And so right now you have your system set up so that it notifies you clearly, yeah. but also Dr. Goodnick. Yes, it, it, this is, I mean, in the future, it's not going to be notifying me. I mean, it's, <laughs> this is for Professor Goodnick. So it's going to notify him and whomever he wants to be notified. So, and it actually should be able to send out multiple texts, multiple recipients. So uh, we have not tried that out yet, um, but might be something we could do in the future, I guess. And so you said that this is a brand new product. It's come out this year. So Most before likely. this, what were people doing? Um, before this, there are a whole bunch of other al- alternatives. Like there's the actual uh, GSM Shield by Arduino. It's like the official one. But it looks like that was discontinued back in 2015, and we were not really aware of that. And we definitely ran into some problems because um, we don't have a lot of experience with Arduinos. This is our first time working with Arduinos. And the GSM Shield, we actually bought an official one, even though it was discontinued. So it was vintage, pretty much. And so when we actually tried it out, it did not work. It did not send any text messages. And then probably a few weeks later, we found out that is only 2G capable. And I think 2G was phased out, at least by AT&T back in 2017. So. Um, we're kind of behind, so, but uh, we actually got a good product that actually looks like it works. This so. is really cool. And so you mentioned an artist. What was her name? Uh, Miss Effie Yassi. Okay, so Miss Yassi. Yeah. Okay, so she's currently living there. Yes, is yes. she using this? 
No, this no. hasn't been implemented yet, but actually the diagram if over here is good because it shows uh, where exactly the Arduinos are going to be set up. And so we plan on having, when we go up to Monument Valley, we can set up three different Arduinos in three different places to measure the voltages. Throughout that, the house. Yeah. You guys are going to go install it? Um, or Dr. Goodnick. <laughs> maybe Dr. Goodnick, maybe. That's fantastic, guys. What a great idea. What a great project. Thank, Thank you. you. Congratulations. I'm really proud of you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Too. The where? We are here with Automated Parallel Parking Car Project. I think I can figure this one out, guys. <laughs> but tell me about your project, Glenn. So our project takes a, a model car and it steers traditionally left and right as well as forward and backwards. And it parks in a space as a traditional car would parallel park. I really need this. Um, <laughs> I cannot parallel park, you guys. So, Catherine, can you do a demonstration for us? Okay, so it's going to park in the middle here. And so you've turned it on. Yep, we've turned it on. It's it's checking to see where the cars are, so it can adjust itself. And there you have it. It has parked. <laughs> that is so cool. So we have two working models. Yes. yes. And John, how much did your project cost? We spent about 150 on it. Nice. Good job. That's a, I feel like that's a good amount. Someone spent like three grand on something that's going into space. Wow. 
So it's like, you guys win highest cost. Um, but this is fantastic. And you have an online teammate. And what's his name? This is Mohammed. Mohammed. Hello, Mohammed. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And so you worked with Dr. Sakalis for this project. And how often did you meet with Dr. Sakalis? I would say we've met um, bi-weekly. So once every two weeks, we would give him updates, uh, tell him progress about how far along the project we were, were going on, um, as well as any suggestions that um, we might have need, needed from his, his end. And so, Glenn, I believe you're an online student, right? Yes. We've so Glenn and I have had some emails back and forth about grad school. Are you also online students? Yes. So we have an entirely online team, and three of you are here in person. Yes. Oh, that's a fun switch. Awesome. That's so cool. So working online requires a lot of remote connectivity and time management and communication skills. Um, do you feel that being in the undergraduate program here at ASU and this has really helped you cultivate those skills? Yes, definitely. And learning online tools like Google Hangout where we could see each other, just share screens, watch the car do its thing and try and troubleshoot it. Um, those kind of tools, which we don't normally have to use. So it really did help with yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Congratulations on something that works at a decent cost and communicating well. Congratulations, guys. Thank you. Have a great day. Hi, Ahmed. Trying to move the cable without killing Glenn. Okay. Hi, guys. What is your team name? Polarization camera. What is that? Yeah, it's a uh, it's a polarization camera, and it can capture transparent stuff. Yeah. So. Like a normal camera, just capture the. Uh, it cannot capture the transparent uh, lens or like stuff objects. It's so, so with the uh, with the polarizer, we can uh, s actually see the shape of the transparent object. Yeah. So. Okay. So like a see-through object. So kind of like. Yeah, yeah. Like, like a water bottle, a clear plastic, yeah, yeah. or a ghost. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not a guess. Okay, fine. So, this is your model. I keep blocking the camera. Um, and let's see. So, we've taken some pictures here. Yes, it's the uh, original picture. So, the Hayden Library. The ha original picture is the Hayden Library. And then, what are these images? Uh, we use the uh, trans uh, uh, degrees of polarization and the uh, trans uh, degrees and uh, use the uh, stocks parameters, get the four pictures and uh, Use a code to convert, use the intensity func function to calculate the, this image. What are the real world applications for this? Okay, so, so this, our goal is to provide a higher quality of image. So, so first, we want to we want to provide us image uh, with with features that cannot be visible by ordinary camera, and also some. Uh, as stated before, some transparent stuff can be can be taken a picture through the through the camera system, and uh, potentially, if this is combined with infrared camera, uh, facial recognition may be may be met. So I cannot imagine the potential of this camera system. There are a lot of potential capabilities for this. So this is something you guys made, and. Do, would you say it's better than cameras that are currently on the market for it being able to do this? Um, yes, I, uh, actually so um, there are more function about the camera, like the thermal, ca thermal camera and uh, there are some other application about the, our projects like the, our uh, facial recognition and also there are more about the uh, information future work about the uh, projects and some uh, more function of that. This is really amazing guys. This is pretty interesting. How, so you guys have been working on this for a year. Tell me about your process from beginning to end. How did you identify the project, start working on it, and then complete? Uh, 
Yeah, uh, we first uh, we took a class like uh, the class was about the polarization. So we think about like making a polarization camera, and we did some research. There's uh, already existing uh, product for the camera uh, polarization camera, but the price was was very high. So we kind of like uh, want to build a very uh, low priced uh, polarization camera. So that's why we want to build this project. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, problems that we encountered. Uh, uh, the most uh, hard uh, part is uh, uh, building the code for the camera to make it function. So yeah. <laughs> were you guys working on the code if that was the hardest part about uh, two months and uh, yeah we are we have to know the Python and uh, the C++ the language we have to control the camera and uh, control the server and uh, use a different degree right so for the code we uh, we have to learn about the code you guys had to learn a lot for this project and I think so you mentioned class that you took did you learn the majority of this on your own yes we have we learned different areas of, of, of different class in different areas so that that helps us to co to co to cooperate together to finish this camera system that's amazing great work you guys congratulations have a great day Team Smart Parking Garage, this looks cool. Tell me about this. Uh, so this is a smart parking garage where uh, we install sensors and our structure to detect if a car is uh, available, if a space is available in a parking structure or not. And the idea here is that we're gonna transmit that information, that data into a web server, into a cloud and display it onto uh, an app that will tell the public if a space is available or not. So this helps with uh, uh, traffic, it technically it helps with pollution as well, and uh, it helps you save time and money with gas and stuff like that. Very interesting. So you, I see we have a model here. Does it work? Yes, it works. So if we try it out, um, on the top it shows uh, with LEDs what spots are available or not um, in case you get there uh, so whenever we remove a parking spot uh, you can see that it updates and then if we refresh an app here the app we're able to see that um, it's refreshing that spot one is taken and two three and four are available so we have one two three and four and then if we put them in we can refresh the app again and it should show that spot one two and four are taken and spot three is still available so so you've created a system that doesn't rely on having the app with the lights you would still be able to drive through the parking garage because some people they put their phones away or they forget them at home and when you're trying to find that one spot and there's like that teeny tiny little car that's like pulled right up in front and you try and pull in and then it's the worst that's really a great idea. So did you guys consider what if it's a particularly sunny day and someone just washed and waxed their car and it's really bright? Would it mess with the sensors? Um, it, it shouldn't. No? It shouldn't, especially with the 
ultrasonic sensor where it, it's at, it should be able to sense the kind of, so the way we would design it, we're going to have multiple floors where we, today we have pocket carpet parking and stuff mm -hmm. like that, so mm -hmm. shine and sunshine and rain okay. wouldn't mess up with it. Okay, so this is specifically currently for covered parking right now, do you think it has the you know, ability to go into open parking lots as well? Yes, it should. Um, that is the intent to have multiple uh, parking spots as well. Um, but for the prototype, we couldn't have carry <laughs> third floor parking in here to show. So it, it should be able to. Awesome. Elijah, how much did you guys spend on your project? Ooh, um, not too much. Um, ballpark uh, right now would be around 100, 120. Nice. nice, not bad. Yeah. Not bad at all. Very cool. And Sam, if you guys could do anything different with your project, what would you do differently? Uh, well, I would have, uh, I worked on the the back end, having the, avail the data available online, and I would have started uh, using a, a third party hoster to host our data. So initially we were trying to have everything in our own internal loop. So like we, we stored the data, we sent it out to the app, and then the app read it. Uh, we had issues make, being able to make that data like publicly available from just anyone on any internet connection. And uh, all that got changed once we switched to Amazon-based web services, which is something that's been, works for years, and it's, it's super good and super reliable. And I, it would have been a lot easier if we had just started there because we wouldn't have had all these different communication issues that we had. So you would have done your own instead of third-party no, hosting. No, I would have just done with third-party third, right third instead of yourself. Because that okay. works. That okay. works consistently. It's simple and easy. All we have to worry about is our side of it instead of having to worry about both sides. Okay. And then you guys made an app for this. Yeah. Yeah. Who developed the app for this? Right there. Elijah, <gasps> tell me about that. Um, so the program I used to develop the app was um, Appery, and uh, with that I connected like I, I put in all the parameters I needed to to connect to the database um, the Amazon database and um, it makes Apri makes everything kind of uh, intuitive is what, what I really like about it so linking the data from the database uh, to like UI elements on the the app so like the available not, not available sign uh, was uh, relatively simple that's amazing congratulations guys great job have Thank a great you. day Thank you. Thank you. Hello! Hello. <laughs> you don't want to be part of this interview, Kevin? Okay. <laughs> All right. You guys have a dragster? Correct. What? Tell me about this. Uh, it's basically a 20 centimeter long dragster, and its sole purpose is to go 20 meters as fast as possible. And it's basically accomplishing this by utilizing uh, a couple of hardware pieces. Uh, that's going to be a uh, Raspberry Pi, which is running a camera for color detection and an Arduino, which is basically running a gyroscope, which is controlling the steering while the camera's not recognizing a specified target, so. So I can see you guys on the video here running through the halls of, it looks like, Goldwater Center. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, very cool. We do have very long hallways. So you guys, I like the project, but why is this needed? <laughs> Why is this needed? Yeah. Um, what it, are the real world like applications for it? Well, because of uh, you know um, driverless driverless cars and stuff like that. So it just is just like proof of concept that we could scale it up. We could use this control system on any kind of like any vehicle really. Um, this is just proof of concept in a smaller vehicle essentially. So. So is it tracking a specific color or yeah. target in these videos? Uh, it's, it's Right now we have it for red. Um, so the target was actually this poster board. Uh, that so really, economical, yeah. you guys. Good job. So yeah, yeah, you also can use it for different uh, colors, shapes. Uh, there's a lot of things you can program it to. Uh, best we had was color for results, yeah. Very cool. And so 3D printed, yes, Patrick? Yes. Did you print all the components here um, here at the ASU Print Lab? Yes, we did. Um, it was kind of challenging for me, at least. Uh, I, you can see from our previous um, designs, sometimes uh, it wouldn't print right, or I just didn't have a correct idea of what we needed. Like, um, we have motor mounts 
uh, installed in two wheels, but then on the back two, we didn't have any, and that was my fault. I didn't realize that we needed both. Um, but then I kept going, and then I eventually built our final, which one, uh, was this one. Uh, so we were going to have uh, the... Doing things. Yeah, yeah we were going to have the camera mounted, and then we were going to have another sensor called an ultrasonic, which would detect how close oh. it is to the object, and then it would have stopped. So this would have gone on top, and it would have been attached by these RC clips over here. Okay. Um, but then... Um, we didn't have enough time to put it all together, which kind of stinks. Well, so you have a working model. You've got a house for it. Uh -huh. It's okay. <laughs> you did great. So here, here's, like a, here's like a live demo. So if the target, if you see it, if the target's uh, on the oh, on the left okay. right here, then the right uh, wheel will spin faster. And if you move it to the other side, it'll, and this is pretty much like what we just implemented at a less of a scale, so it could take more uh, nuanced turns to the target. So. I, mean, I can find someone with a red shirt and we can have them run around if you want. Oh, yeah, red Do we want to cause some mayhem, guys? Uh, that's been the joke. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> red shoes would be better if we wanted to... Oh, everyone ankles. look at the shoes. Oh. She's got red shoes. That girl's got red shoes. We don't want to break any ankles today. So. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, we won't cause any harm. Yeah. So... Um, everything was printed here at the ASU Print Lab. You've learned a lot about the design yeah. and printing, it looks like. Um, how much did your project cost? Liam, can you tell me about that? Uh, probably around like 300. Um, ESC, motors, batteries, Pi, gyro, microcontroller, um, and they all have to be pretty high quality uh, for the speeds we're going at. So that did add up pretty quickly. So. Very cool. If there were anything that you could do differently, Edwin, yes. for your entire project, whatever you would want to change, what would you do? I think that I wouldn't want to change the way we actually planned this out. I think the first semester we had a lot of like, oh yeah, let's do this, let's do that. But I think if we planned out maybe more strict, stricter deadlines, uh, we would have had more time for testing and even have more time to even finish this project to even its full potential. Yeah, I would say that. That that's I think that's a great answer. I've been asking that question to a lot of people and they always say, oh, we'd want to enhance this, we'd want to change this. But I think the planning aspect, because that's one of the things that we were trying to you know, convey in this course of how do you plan a project beginning to end. Right. That's fantastic that even though you guys felt a little disappointed in what you know, your planning abilities, you learned from it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, even even towards the end, like oh, if only I had one more week, we could have had this at the end or this implemented. But you yeah. know, you know that's part of the learning process. You learn, um, you know, to make even like uh, one of the thing, one of the things I learned here is like to have an MVP, a minimal viable product. Even if we have a working product, we can work with that and test it and say, oh, you know what, the things that we've learned is implemented on this product, and we can move forward with that. So I really like that I learned that from this course. Yeah, that's awesome, guys. Congratulations, great, great project at the end of the day if we want to like get crazy let me know let's yeah. let's send it after someone <laughs> congratulations guys okay we're gonna go to this team hello guys Sorry. positions hello. everyone ready <laughs> got mm. you have a very fancy poster i'm getting distracted gyroscopic stabilizer system Yep. Yes. Ooh, complicated. Tell me about your project. Oh, let's start with Brian. Brian. So, so our project is um, we wanted to design a modular stabilizer system. Modular meaning um, you can move it between applications. So we started off with gyroscopes, and for example of modularity, we attached it to a compound bow. Um, one on each limb, top and bottom. When the gyroscopes are spun up, they create a type of resistance that is perpendicular from the spinning mass. And as you can see from the targets down there, before the one on the left, those are five arrows that were shot from about 20 to 25 yards away. And you can see there's about an eight inch spread between um, our results. And the target on the right side, after we spun the, the gyroscopes up, we actually reduced our horizontal spread um, and just there you only have a vertical spread because that is a result of general gravity for the, the flight of the arrow. This is really cool. This is not what I was expecting when I read the title, you guys. So, is this it? Yes. Okay, and that, that gets attached to a bow? 
Yes, so you can attach these two gyroscopes to a bow or pretty much whatever you would like to attach them to uh, via these hose clamps right here. So that's what makes our system modular. We programmed an Arduino to control the speed, to control our different on, off, one motor, two motor states. And so here, by, this is, if you're gonna try it, this is lock the both axes. So the, the, the movement you do, that will create this, yeah, you feel, you feel the resistance there, you know? So, and especially with this design, you could use that for a bow. You could use that go for a club or any army weapon or medical stuff just to give you more stabilizing there, you know? Yeah. Like this? Yeah, because that's really hard to like try and go like that. Yes. Wow. So if both of them work in with the full power, you will, it will be more stabilizing, you know? That is so cool! <laughs> So this can be easily removed from the compound bow and added to a, say, a golf club to prevent curve of the ball. You can also add it onto, say, a recreational rifle for target practice. You can also attach it onto a um, power drill <laughs> or any type of medical equipment. No, 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 you're, 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 fine. you're fine, you're fine. I almost broke their project. <laughs> Don't make me pay for it. How much did you guys spend on this? Overall cost was. I love the detailed cost list, you guys. That's awesome. Four hundred and seven dollars and thirty-seven cents. Very cool. Plus, plus labor. That's right. <laughs> Some of these. For example, the, the 3D printed filament, you don't have to worry about it. That was for practice runs, practice uh, frames. Um, so that cost would be negligible. Um, same with, well, the 3D printers set at zero because that was, that was donated. Um, Who donated a 3D printer to you? I, we, we used mine from home. Oh, <laughs> I was like, someone was just like, here's a 3D printer. I, I donated it to the group for the purposes of the project at the okay. time. Well, this is a really cool project, you guys. This is really impressive. And so I see, I think that's the background on your computer. You guys went to the archery range to test this out. Oh, it's a video? Yes, because we clearly can't have a bow and arrow here at ASU. Yeah, they, they weren't too happy about letting us bring a compound bow in here. It was a long process to take. We need to contact the ASU police to get approval to get a, the bow here on campus. So we just stick with this for the demo day. Like, for a stick, yeah. So it, they wouldn't even allow the bow. It will be considered as a weapon. Yeah, yeah. anything mm -hmm. that does a projectile is considered to be dangerous. All right. Well, so you guys improvised. You couldn't bring the bow, so you created yeah. a stand for it. Yeah, that's the stand, and with this stick, that will be the presentation the presentation here. Yeah. That's great improvisation, guys. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Wow. Very cool project. And you guys have also nominated yourself for yes. the Palais Senior Design Prize. There are secret judges everywhere. Uh, Everyone you talk to could be a secret judge, and I'm not going to tell you who they are. Please so, tell us. Nope. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. So you can't even bribe me. Um, so everyone you talk to, explain your project as great as you just did to me. Yes, ma'am. Congratulations, Thank guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a great day. Thank you so much, yeah. <laughs> this team? Hello. Look Hello. at you guys already and lined up. Hi, Ali. Hi, how you doing? Good, how are you? Not too bad, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your project. So our project is about radar sense and object detection. Uh, the whole point of our project is to record data using radar and that data actually combine it with the image and actually gaff the data itself on the image where, is the object, where there is an object or a guy on the image itself and tell you where exactly the location of the object on the image. So we started our project is by doing two experiments. The first experiment was in uh, lot 59 which just to study the purpose of our project, how to see the, the reactor objects. And we, if, as you can see over here, we have the waveform, which is tell you every time the uh, detect an object, 
the uh, called the peak. And the second purpose of that experiment was to study the heat map. Uh, we can see as the bottom picture over there, a car represent as one big mass over here. And if you have like four people standing beside each other, it's actually generate almost similar uh, picture, but although it's not actually exactly one beside each other, but uh, since it's like there is not enough like z distance to see it as one big uh, object. Very interesting. Johan, can you tell me why this is needed? Why is this important? This is important. Uh, the application will come further if we can get it to real time for autonomous vehicles, basically. As radar technology, uh, most people sh would know it's good for long range and weather conditions. It's good for snow, rain, and any like that good stuff. It lacks in range resolution. So what we did with the video and merging the video with the radar data is trying to uh, beat that obstacle by showing the user like this is what you'll see and this is what the radar sees so in case there's a false point or something false detected you'll be alerted as well and not just be possibly hit something that was falsely detected very interesting and so this is it I believe yes this is the setup okay this is the recorded session that we did over here you can see it, uh, the green dot signify the radar detecting everything and then that's the person walking by so it's we merged the video and the radar uh, data all Sorry, right I'm trying to get out yeah I'm trying to get out of his way too <laughs> so you can see it's all merged there and you can see um, the green dots again signify the radar and the video is there and you can see how we merge it together this is right now is uh, just showing you real time this is the radar working there's a lot of static right now within the gym and everything mm -hmm. so it's, there's a little off there and then this is the camera we use with the video over here as well very interesting I can't see your name Nermeen. Nermeen it's great to meet you tell me how much your project cost it cost about 300 okay. um, but we may, mainly got sponsorship from TI so that really helped our budget Sponsorship from TI. Very cool. So you were working with TI and also Dr. Yu? Yes, Dr. Yeah. Did you enjoy working with the company, Salom? Uh, absolutely. I'd say probably the biggest part about working with the company was being able to have that experience as far as that talking back and forth with the uh, TI representatives and just building that relationship as far as uh, what to expect in the real world when it does come to situations like this and being able to demonstrate uh, good communication along the way so it's definitely probably like one of the biggest aspects of it. That is a big difference I would say between an educational sphere and a business sphere. The, yes. the differences in communication and how to navigate that because that's not something we really teach. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So I mean that was a challenge in itself just being able to gather the information that you needed for the project and to build that relationship with TI and be able to communicate effectively what we needed from them as far as a third party and not to mention uh, speaking with our professor and being on point with him as far as what was needed in the process of being able to get our experiment up and running and to eventually run effectively and get the project that we have right now. So yeah, it was a good experience overall, I'd say. That's fantastic. If there were anything that you guys could change in your project, anything at all, is there anything you would change? Actually, if anything, I'll record more data and see how the radar react to it and try to actually implement it more efficiently. Because right now we only have like 5,000 data points, which is like that give you a recording of like two to five, two to three minutes max. Mm -hmm. But if you actually increase it like for like say like 10 or 15, but that's going to generate way more than 5,000 data points. And the trick would be like how to process that data and see how to react to it. Very cool. Well, congratulations, guys. Great project and great job. Thank you. Appreciate Have a it. great day. Back to this team. So Running in the middle. Hi, guys. <laughs> I really like the innovation here with the tape. Yeah. Would it not stick to your suit? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> Good job. Way to make that work. Wireless power charging. Can you please tell me about your project? Yeah, the project was um, a wireless uh, power charging where it's charge your phone uh, from a distance, any electronic device. We started with um, phones, smartwatches, um, because they do have a receiver, Wi-Fi receiver charge. So in that case, if we charge the, if we put the wireless charger underneath the table, it will charge your phone wirelessly, with no need for physical contact. That was the idea. So it's the no need for physical contact thing, because like my wireless charger for my 
my watch requires the physical contact. Right. Okay, so how do you get th how do you get past that barrier? What barrier? So the need for the physical contact because if it's through the table, right. how are we still well, charging the device? Yeah, so that is uh, an electromagnetic field. So uh, we are like uh, inducing uh, an electromagnetic magnetic field through the current that is passing through the the two inductors, which is uh, which are these the cross sec uh, cross uh, uh, inductors. So once the current is passing through through the the inductor, the electromagnetic magnetic field is being induced, and then it. It's being sent through through the air to the secondary uh, uh, device, to the secondary part, which is the the mobile or, or uh, mm -hmm. your watch in this case, and that is the whole process for charging. So basically, this is the circuit. This is the simulation. It works perfectly fine. Um, but when it when we came to build the prototype. We had some issues, and that was only because of the lack of the mentorship. Um, our hopes and ambition was set high standard, um, and we were aiming for the um, um, the filing a patent. Yeah. Filing oh, you were going to file a patent. That yeah. was a brilliant idea because nobody done it before. That was what we aiming for, um, but unfortunately, um, this is a lost cause. Um, the lack of mentorship, as I as, as I said. So is this something that you could continue to work on in the future, though? Yes, it is. It is. We learned a lot. Um, we built the circuit. We, we did a lot of research. And we will get it done soon. Soon, hopefully, yeah. yeah so, so, so we will continue uh, in the path of the filing the patent. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, and the right, uh, like, uh, meanwhile, because we have like a, uh, like, uh, unique a specific, mm -hmm. unique circuit with a, new, uh, a unique numbers, so that would be patent. That's very interesting, and so I see you have an online team member. Hi, thank you for joining us. Um, what was it like working with an in-person and online hybrid group? Well, it wasn't exactly easy because, um, first of all, we're working with different time zones, and at the same time, a lot of the work is either uh, is either on hand or is either on the computer so it really can't be shared easily so we really had to work across the distance across, uh, and there are many challenges along the way but it all worked well so far. That's fantastic so you did the simulation do you have a working product? Uh, not a not working product okay. because uh, we have like some uh, limitations using uh, our uh, like device mm -hmm. so can you just give me some space? So, these four NMOSes okay. have like um, it, it, it does have like a high rating in, for current, but in reality, other than the simulation, and this uh, you see it, it worked perfectly in the simulation. Mm -hmm. But in reality, we, we did we just have that the, the materialistic barrier. So, yeah. so that was one limitation for us. So yeah, that this was like one of the problems that limited us from finishing our project successfully. It sounds like you learned a lot though. And knowing the limitations and knowing the barriers, that helps you move forward with this project. You could probably easily turn this into a PhD degree. Yes. Have you guys been thinking about graduate school? We've been thinking of proceeding the um, idea. Um, and work on it, keep working on it, because it is, uh, business-wise, it is a good idea. Um, and hopefully, yeah, soon, hopefully, we have a strong um, hope about getting it done. Well, congratulations, guys. I think it's great. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Have thank a great you. day. Okay. Hi, friends. Hey. Hello. I think... Okay, I know I've talked to every single one of you before. Yay! So this is, and I was like, that's your title? Um, analysis and Simulation of Chaotic System. 
So analysis and simulation of chaotic system. You basically just like recorded my day and you were like, she's chaotic. Here we go. And that was done. We found some great findings. We're going to be, we're going to be publishing a journal paper on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Easiest project ever. Okay. But so, tell me about your project for right, real. So what the heck is it really, right? So think about really simple tasks you do every day. Stuff like getting out of bed or carrying your groceries. We can do these things without thinking, but for robots, it's actually really, really complicated. So researchers around the country are studying how humans manipulate objects to design the robots of tomorrow, and that's what our project is focusing on. So chaotic systems. I like how you guys really deceived me with the titles. You didn't say robotics at all in the title. <laughs> so one of the concepts you had here was a coffee cup system. Right. I, I feel coffee deeply in my soul, so I like That's immediately exactly gravitated toward it. that. Yeah, you were like yeah. Lynn's ear. Yeah, there you go. This morning, I was manipulating. <laughs> coffee this so, Carrie, can you explain the images that you have? Um, yes. Yeah, so this is um, so we modeled it based on a car single carton pendulum model, um, and we used MATLAB for this. Um, so starting here, they inside the research papers, we can actually take you back to this model real quick. Ooh, let's right. go. And I will try not to block the camera. Sorry, Abdul, getting up in your space. So we based um, our system off of a couple research papers which focused on human interaction with the system. Um, and they found two strategies. One was a low frequency strategy, which he's demonstrating right here, where the cart and the pendulum are in phase with each other. And then the second strategy that they found was a high frequency strategy, um, where they're 180 degrees out of phase. Okay. And so and <laughs> Here, I, coming over to me. So, okay, what's our contribution to this, right? So, for the most part, people have been collecting human test subject data. The data is really insightful, but what we bring to the table is a complex mathematical analysis uh, to the system. Now, we're not going to start writing out differential equations for you, so don't worry about that. <laughs> but, if you do look at some simulation results over here, Take the mic, you do it, man. Sure. You go. We can see the exact same thing that we just saw. Show me. For example, <laughs> here on the right, we have the low frequency strategy. What are you looking at? Well, the blue is the cart displacement, and the orange is the angular displacement of the pendulum. And we can see that they move in phase with each other. The peaks align with the peaks. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we have the high frequency strategy where the cart and the pendulum are out of phase with each other. They move out of phase. Now our research and our simulations reveal there's actually a third region where we start to excite the nonlinear elements of the system. So complicated stuff starts happening, chaotic stuff starts happening. And how is this applicable? Right? I'm a robot and I'm manipulating a system that might be flexible or it has internal modes. I would either want to use this strategy or this strategy because the behavior of the system is more predictable. In this region, I would not want to do that because we have a lot of higher order oscillations happening. You wouldn't want that in a manufacturing setting. And it makes sense too, it's why humans either use this strategy or this strategy, they weren't found to exploit this frequency range. You guys, this is really cool and I feel like you could do a lot with this. Did you know that we have a robotics program? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer, Dominic. Thank you. Um, I feel like this could easily turn into some research that could be thesis worthy in the robotics program or even a PhD program. Have you guys thought about grad school? I have. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is not doing it. Okay, Abdul, I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> are you okay. going to use any of this for grad school? I'm not sure yet. No? Okay. I don't know. Right. Uh, but I am doing my master's in a robotics related field, so we'll see how it goes. Awesome. I'll take that back from you. Well, congratulations, guys Gr and lady. Um, great project. I like it a lot. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Electromagnetic bycatch reduction device. Yes. Now, all day long, I've been reading these titles and they I'm constantly surprised what it actually means <laughs> when you guys describe it to me. So tell me what this means because I don't understand this. Okay, so first of all, like uh, what is bycatch? First of all, bycatch okay. is when unwanted marine species get caught in fishermen's nets. Okay. Mostly like uh, endangered species such as sea turtles and sharks. Mm -hmm. And mostly we're concentrated in sea turtles and sharks. Mm -hmm. And then, so according to some estimates, like 
the global bycatch may amount to about 40% of the world's catch, which actually totals 63 billion pounds per year. And so which results like bycatch creates pollution and actually promotes habitat destruction. And so some of the previous research that's been done is that uh, research has shown that sharks and sea turtles are actually quite sensitive to magnetic fields and w in the range of 25 microteslas to about 100 uh, microteslas. And then so they had actually like a, a test with sea turtles where they attached magnets to their heads and it actually affected their migration pattern. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. And so this is basically what our project is about, is about uh, creating like a magnet so that it could deter like endangered species like when they get caught in like fishermen's nets. Okay. Yeah. So you guys, you don't have any fish in there. Did you know that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we don't, we don't have any fish in there. <laughs> you guys are aware that there's no <laughs> endangered species in there, which is probably a good thing. Thank you for not going to the aquarium and taking any of them. So, do you have? So this is a model, working model. Yeah, that's. A what to do? Model. Can you show me? Yeah. Yeah. Who yeah. wants to show me? All right. So okay. basically, what you're gonna see here on the screen is uh, the ambient magnetic field, and when I turn it on. You're gonna see it go up to 152, and that's basically gonna deter the turtles because okay. they can detect that. Uh, okay, so turtles can detect 152. Yeah. Okay. What about dolphins? What about other animals? The species that our professor had us focus on were just sharks and sea turtles. Okay. So we didn't really do much research into dolphins. Okay. okay. Sharks and sea turtles. So. Do they both, do you, do you need different frequencies? Are they the same frequency? Uh, magnetic field doesn't involve, magnetic field, okay. yeah, yeah, it doesn't. I'm not an electrical yeah, engineer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> doesn't it, it doesn't involve frequency, so we're just passing like a, a, a flat current through it, just okay. switching it on and off, uh, and that's what generates the field. Very cool. So, it's clearly working. Yes. Um, has Dr. Blaine Christian were you guys tested any of this? Did you guys get a nice beach trip out of this project? Uh, we wish, uh, but <laughs> we were supposed to go on a trip, but uh, it didn't work out, so okay. maybe in the future. <laughs> awesome. If there were anything that you guys could change in your project at all, what would you change? Um, an improvement we could make is definitely changing the core of the inductor. Uh, right now it's an air core, uh, and that gave us some problems with uh, the magnitude of the magnetic field. Very interesting. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm going to go over here. <laughs> hey, Marcus, where's your team? Where's the team? <laughs> Motor controls. Tell me about your project. Uh, our project is to design a three phase brushless DC motor. Okay. 270 uh, voltage DC okay. with 35 amps uh, of current. Why is this important? Why is it important? It's a, you can say it's a motor that's more re reliable, mm -hmm. less maintenance, and it could be cheap. And cheaper. There you go. Money. That's why it's important. And so, let's see. What do you mean by requested speed signal so, and then actual rotor speed? So this right here, those are the requested, like, so say you wanted 1,000 RPMs at that point right there. Okay. That is the requested speed that, like, the computer is sending. <clears throat> and then that's the actual, that's the actual RPM speed measured from the rotor of the simulated motor. Oh, okay. Okay, so there is a difference there. Yeah. Okay. So it's not just perfectly linear and flat like the requested signal that we want because there is some overshoot, and then it has a torque applied to it as well, so there is a little bit of fluctuation in their actual motor speed. Very interesting. And Mohammed, what faculty member did you work with as your mentor? Uh, what, again? Did you work with the faculty member as your team mentor? Yeah. North oh, you worked with Northrop Grunham, not one of the faculty members. You worked with Industry Connections. Yes. What was that like? Uh, well, I'm just connecting with them by emails and phone, so okay. we didn't like meet as a person. Okay. Yeah, that, that's it, I think. Okay. One of the other teams that I talked to mentioned um, there's a difference in communication style, yeah, especially with industry. Yeah, it's very hard when it came with the emails and phones. 
because sometimes he's busy and he can't respond at this time while we need it. We need it. Right. So that's what makes it yes. much uh, harder. That makes it harder. Yeah. Very interesting. If there were anything that you could change about your project, Marcus, what would you change? Um, probably to actually have access to a 270 volt motor, just because since we weren't able to get to one, we weren't actually be able to build a prototype, so everything we had to do is simulation based. It'd be a lot nicer to know that our project actually worked in real life rather than just in the simulation. That makes sense. Well, congratulations, guys. Thank have you. a great day. You too. Hello. Sadia, Sadia. Sadia, thank you. Quadcopter position indicator. Can you tell me about your project? Yes, yeah, so um, with the increase in unmanned aerial systems, such as quadcopters and drones, um, it became like um, an advantage to um, see the position of whatever we're wanting to detect, such as that drone, from two different vantage points rather than one. So this helps um, increase accuracy and gives us a little bit more range in what we can do. So like, you know, with quadcopters and everything, like, uh, they have to access remote areas or carry precious cargo. So this uh, system basically just gives us information, and it's much more, um, uh, it's much cheaper than like the uh, comparable like lighter systems, which are like seventy-five thousand. Um, this ended up being under a hundred bucks. So a <laughs> hundred dollars. That's fantastic. I think you might have lowest cost. Congratulations. Yay, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So it's just using the basic method of triangulation to find um, like the position of here. I have a ball because. Um, uh, I'm using OpenCV and uh, Raspberry Pi to detect the um, object, so since the ball is kind of brightly colored, it picks it up easier. So, um, yeah, it's just like uh, the basic method of triangulation that's been around for 100 years, just applied to a near purpose. That's really interesting. So it costs less than $100, and you were working with Dr. Sakalis. What was it like working with a faculty member on such a complicated research project? Um, I really appreciated his, like, he was just very, like, kind and supportive on the project, like, in terms of, like, understanding my concerns and everything and just, like, giving me tips. So um, he's a really good professor in terms of that, so I appreciated his help. <laughs> That's fantastic. And so... IEE considerations. Did you work with IEE or IEEE? Um, no, I was just uh, so part of the um, entire of the project is considering how it would affect economic and health <laughs> and environmental issues. So oh, that's okay. what I was looking at okay. more like how would um, this technology be implemented to like um, assist in some of those issues. So for like environmental aspects. So for um, like diesel powered engines, it takes like um, one kilogram. So it produces one kilogram, kilogram of like uh, carbon dioxide per package. But um, with like quadcopters and drones it produces 0.42 so like there's a lot of like um, environmental impacts that can um, be uh, reduced by it and um, just like the overall cost is cheaper than like transporting it by like a huge vehicle right so <laughs> um, yeah just uh, trying to see how it would affect the um, world in um, the larger scheme of things. Fantastic. If there anything that you could do differently, what would you do? Um, so I'd probably, um, there, it's still more in the theoretical phase, so uh, just like testing it out and building the actual prototype. So um, just seeing where the in inconsistencies, inconsistencies lie in terms of like a building that. So um, that's something I would like to explore in the future. Fantastic. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Have a great day. Oh, I am interested to learn about this. What do we have going on here, Tyler? What is your project? Plus Alliance Energy Sculpture Drinking Fountain Project. You might win longest title. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Tell me about your project. So our initial scope was that we were involved with a organization by the name of the Plus Alliance, which is a culmination of ASU, King's College in London, and then a university out of Melbourne, Australia. Hmm. The initial scope was we were going to build a self-sustainable drinking fountain of where it would take unprocessed water. Mm -hmm. We later decided on a lake called Canada Water Lake, which is just adjacent to the grounds of King's College in London, okay. uh, which is where we were uh, initially building it. We take the unprocessed water, filter it using nothing but solar or other sustainable energy sources, filter it so that it would be safe for human consumption. And on top of that, we had to have some sort of an artistic or sculptural component along with it. So we design it, we, we go over to London, we build something similar to it, 
and then we come back over here to Arizona and build our own version of it since we're not able to actually take what we had in London and bring it back over here. So what we have behind us mm -hmm. is our version for more centered for ASU, still the original scope of self-powered, taking unprocessed water with a artistic element, but now it's at ASU and at Tempe Town Lake. So it's actually here at Tempe Town Lake? No, no, no. no we sure. haven't actually built oh, it. Oh, okay. Not yeah. Yet. We, yeah, we just have our demo <laughs> behind us. And so we, at, we have the solar panel, a charge controller, and a battery, which is all the electrical components, and then a ceramic filter, which is what actually filters the water. Very interesting. So you guys went over to London to work on this project. A few of us did. A few of you did? Who all went? I did. By a few, you mean one? Okay. Yeah, two. two, okay. We two. We have an online <laughs> student as well. We have oh, very well. cool. So, Frank, what was that like working at, because were you using the other university's facilities for this? Absolutely. So we went there and we were using King's College, um, and then the students from Sydney came over from Australia. They were there actually longer than we were, uh, which was great. But working with that international team in, in, a, different, in a different country with different uh, aspects of people's attitudes and, and their different culture backgrounds was pretty educating. Um, as far as an engineer getting into trying to work as a team and an international team was, was a really good experience. That's really interesting. I think you guys might have had like the most largely collaborative team that I've, for everyone that I've talked to, no one has had something on that scale. So that's amazing. That's fantastic. And so it looks like, is this the cost of running this the... Is a, this is a yearly cost of running the, the pump um, with the solar system that we have. Eight dollars. Eight bucks. And so that's the yearly cost of running a completely sustainable, self-sustaining water filter. The saved cost. The saved cost. That's actually saying if you use the same energy from just an outlet, that's how much it would cost. This would be able to produce that much worth of saved uh, energy value. Very interesting. Are we able to see a demo or just not in the gym? We, yeah, we, d we decided to do it dry today okay. just because we don't want to be lugging around nasty water and having it spill. So, yeah, it's, it's dry, but we have tested it. We have actually run an array of tests running all the way from copper, iron to pesticides and lead. That's amazing. I'm really proud of you guys. This is a great project, and I really like the international co collaboration that you guys participated in. That's fantastic. And so we had Frank, are you, or Frank, I think you're an online student, correct? correct. Okay, Tyler, I think you're an in-person student. In -person. And then we had two other online students, two we or three? One other online student, and then we have one team member sick today. Oh, everyone's sick today. Um, wow, you guys had a large team and you worked with a lot of people. What was it like collaborating with so many people literally around the world? Hard. Um, hard <laughs> um, because having two different completely time zones of oh, London yeah. and then Arizona yeah. by the time that they had already done stuff in London I was just waking up right and so I would then do my stuff but I wouldn't receive an answer until 8 o'clock at night mm -hmm. when I'm going to bed <laughs> so it was having to flip-flop between each other so it was handing things back off to each other and then waiting yes communication and waiting yes well if there were anything that you guys could change about your project is there anything you would the budget the uh, budget you know, we're some really <laughs> tight budget constraints. but um <laughs> with more budget we could have made it a lot more self-sustaining a lot more self-controlled fantastic well congratulations you guys this is an awesome project Great job. Thank you. Hello. Hi. I'm here to interview you, I Kyle. Guess later. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Kyle. You are part of the quadcopter position control team, and I believe two of your team members are online, right. and I think I've interviewed them. Yes, you have. Do you want to know what they said about you? No. <laughs> they said so. very nice things. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your project. All right, so we have a... We, our, our challenge was to build a quadcopter control system that can be controlled with a camera. Mm -hmm. um, and 
by doing that, it just means uh, take the camera, point it somewhere, and have the quadcopter go wherever you point, point and shoot kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Um, well, I mean, I think it's more about the concept and not just mm -hmm. playing with a toy, like having a camera detect something and give some kind of response. Okay. Very interesting. And when I had interviewed your team members, they had said that sometimes it's better to have...
Team Maverick, thank you for joining me today to record your interview for um, the ECE Capstone Senior Design Demo Day. We've got quite the title now for this event. Um, can you please introduce yourselves to me? Uh, my name is Craig Clarkston. I'm Sam Porter. Roy Knapp. Brittany Floyd. Well, it's nice to meet you all. Um, can you please explain to me what you did because your team name is Team Maverick and I can't figure it out. <laughs> Tell me about your project. So the team name is because I work for a company called Moog in East Aurora, New York, and um, they're developing a autonomous vehicle named Maverick. It's the Moog Autonomous Vehicle Integrated Circuits or something. I forget the C. But uh, the job of this vehicle is to go up and down apple orchards, scan trees, and determine which apples are ready to be harvested. Um, it'll also determine the health of the trees. We'll be able to spray fertilizers, things like that. Um, and the name of the vehicle, again, is Maverick. So that's where our team name came from. It's, uh, I, asking around that work, um, got in touch with some of the engineers on that team, and they offered to let us help on their project, and we went forward from there. That's awesome. This is a really unique opportunity that you had access to through work, because I don't think any of the other teams um, probably have done anything this large. Um, Wow, can you tell me more about it and what it was like working with the company? Uh, well, I, I can't talk for everyone else, but I'm the only one local to the and that works for the company, so I was kind of the, the middleman for everything. Okay. Um, my work initially was extremely supportive, um, but as they ran into technical aspects or issues that they were having with the vehicle itself, we were mainly doing the software of trying to write a program that would actually identify the apples on the trees. So the help that we were hoping to get over the summer from them didn't materialize as much as we wish it would, um, but they are still very interested in our work. Now, their deadlines increased by maybe a year as to what they thought it would be, um, but hopefully like we can keep in touch with everybody here and uh, either use what we've done or maybe try to continue doing what we are doing with the company. Okay, so your project kind of changed into software. Our correct? project was very fluid. In the beginning, it was kind of, uh, you know, they left it up to us. They told us what were some of their challenges that they knew they were gonna have down the road. And they asked us if there's any of these that we could tackle either, um, uh, on our own path or kind of like parallel with them and see who came up with the better uh, solution to the problem. Um, so they gave us a lot of freedom in what we could do. And that was actually one of the challenges that we had as a team is you have this big scope of a project mm -hmm. and you have this wide open window on what you can do. How do you narrow it down? How do you pick something that we could accomplish in two semesters? Roughly what, nine months I think it was or a little longer. Um, how do you narrow that down and come up with something that we could actually present for our capstone project? Very interesting. So, Brittany, <laughs> would you say that you were able to accomplish what you had set out to accomplish as a team? Yeah, I think um, we did have a, so we did struggle a lot with the um, scope creep, so to call. Um, we kind of started working on the identifying the apples thing and then we sort of broadened it to what, well, we had to make a decision. Do we want to do just good or bad apples? Do we want, um, you know, these apples are good, but are they ripe? And so ultimately we, we had to make those decisions and we kind of decided um, that it'd be the most useful to say, yes, this is a good apple, but also is it ready to be picked or not? So that was, um, Kind of one of the biggest challenges to just like sort of keep the scope defined and keep it from getting too big and but also trying to like push ourselves and make the most of the project mm -hmm. and so ultimately how did you come up with the programming or the software for it to determine it sees this apple versus this apple and it knows the difference 
Um, I think Roy can better speak to that, but um, I know we used um, the color spectrum of the apple, just sort of drawing a line from one end of the apple to the other and um, using that range of colors to determine whether or not the apple was ripe or if it was even rotten, it needed to be tossed out completely. Uh, so as far as software, um, machine learning is really picking up a ton of traction now and it's really accessible to everyone thanks to Google. So Google created TensorFlow, which is a very high level API that is very user friendly, um, pretty easy to learn and pick up and they just came out with their new TensorFlow version 2.0. So in the beginning, um, we just went with the open source, what was available and uh, we found out that the machine learning community is uh, uh, pretty, pretty wide and anyone nowadays can get access and start developing their own programs and software like this. Uh, you don't need to have a supercomputer. As we found out through the process, um, our home laptops couldn't actually, they didn't have the processing power to train the models to identify what we needed them to identify. I think the first run, my computer told me it would take 63 days to train it and then it crashed. Um, yeah. But uh, there's online, uh, well, you can remote into a GPU and you pay very, very low uh, price per hour. I think right now we pay like 50 cents an hour to, to train our models online through a web, uh, website called Paperspace. And that was really the only cost to this project. Other than that, um, you know, we had, we had some hiccups along the way. We wanted to use TensorFlow 2.0 because it was brand new. We trained a couple models that were successful, but the, the problem was it was just identifying an image and classifying it what we wanted. It couldn't actually pick out what the object was within the image. So we could have shown it a picture of a cat and it would have guessed if it was a good or bad apple. <laughs> it was a high, yeah, it, it, it couldn't tell. Um, so in order to get a bounding box, um, there, the community support wasn't quite there because TensorFlow 2.0 was is relatively new and in order to get a working product that could take a video feed and give us an output uh we had to revert back to the highest version of tensorflow before they came out with 2.0 it's like uh 1.15 and um it, it things got a little difficult because it's a little bit lower level api the training's a little bit different. Uh, it didn't all match up. So it was almost like halfway through when we felt like we were really gaining traction, we had to start over. Um, but eventually we got to where we could get video to detect objects and we're, we're still not quite to where we could give this to Moog and they could just run it on their um, robot because we needed it to run faster. We've got it working, but it's, the model that we trained is too big and it, we need a more simple model that will run uh, in real time. So that's where we're at right now. Interesting. And so you guys had a lot of struggles along the way, which I think is very good experience for working out in the field. Um, do you all currently work in a field related to electrical engineering? I am an engineer at Moog. Okay, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in your jobs, have you ever experienced anything like this before? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, there's always shifting timelines and at work. Normally, there's like management that absorbs all of that and figures out the schedule. So, it's a little bit different playing both roles here. That definitely makes it easier at work when, you know, someone just tells you what to do. But yeah, no, definitely. This is an, a perfect example of how the workforce has been in my experience. I would say one of the nice things for me is uh, my company has branches all over the world. So I'm sometimes working with another team and actually we have a branch in New Mexico and Virginia. And sometimes I'm always on conference calls like this trying to solve a problem. And working with these guys, it was much the same way. You know, we try to schedule team meetings once a week or twice a week as needed. Um, we always try to set times to work together uh, to try to work out any issues that we were having. And so working in an online team, because you are all online, I'm assuming you guys aren't just like down the street from each other. You guys are states away. You're in different time zones. Did you have any issues navigating that? 
I don't think we really did. I, I mean, st you know, using like Google Hangouts and using um, uh, like the shared drive that we had on Google, uh, you know, we were constantly editing our papers together. Um, we would post something, have everyone else read it, edit it, stuff like that. Um, I think maybe 10 years ago, we would have had a really hard time, but as technology has like gotten more advanced, um, it wasn't too challenging, especially for our project. I think if we had to build something that was more hands-on, that might've been uh, more of an issue, but I, I think that's one of the reasons why this project actually worked in our benefit. If there's anything that you guys could do differently, what would you do if you had all the time and all the money in the world to <laughs> work on your project more? Is there anything that you would do differently? Outsource I mean, I think, it to India. What? Outsource it to India. <laughs> yeah, time and money are the two limiting factors. If we had all the time and money in the world, we would have like a freaking <laughs> whole, the whole car would be in my room right now. It'd be done. <laughs> <laughs> if um if i had the time and the money i would definitely have been out at the orchard that moog is working with um it would have been easier to create a data set so another huge issue that we ran into was oh, we were told that we would be given all the images and they would already be classified and we didn't get that information so we had to construct our own data set um mm -hmm. off of open source uh, libraries and we had to painstakingly go through thousands and thousands of images, um, map the mean value of the color space data, because that's how we eventually classified the data into what was a good apple, what was the most valuable apple. And then we had to go into each image and box individually each apple on each image so that this could all be ran through and trained. So that was the time consuming part. Um, I would just like to do it in the environment that the robot's already gonna be in and get some video feed from there. And I think that would have made a huge difference um, in actual use of this because then every image would have been on a tree in the correct environment and I think it would have been a little better. Uh, and also we were told by Moog that the market research showed that the color of an apple really dictates its value and not necessarily how fresh it is. And that these processing plants, uh, they run it through their machine and it takes a bunch of pictures and tells you if it's a 35 cent or a five cent apple. And um, I was hoping that we could just get a hold of that data that that machine uses to determine the value of the Apple so we could just use that information in training our model. But um, had I been actually working on this as a job and making money for it, uh, that's where I would be if I was leading the project. I would be at the processing plant getting that data from them, taking the pictures and videos on the actual orchard we're gonna work this thing on. Um, and I guarantee, uh, it, it would, like Sam said, it would be tangible. We'd be touching it right now. It'd be out there working. But, um, you know, we all got our full-time jobs, full-time families, and other right. things. Well, thank you so much for meeting with me today, everyone. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry that you had such struggles, but I'm really proud that you were able to overcome them and find different routes, because that is one of the main purposes of having the capstone event, is to teach you that you know in life this is going to happen and it sounds like luckily you guys have already had some experience in those situations so you were able to handle it well yeah luckily other projects have had time issues and stuff in, in my real job yeah luckily <laughs> yeah well congratulations on completing your project and completing your degree thank you thank for you. taking the time to meet with me everyone thank you thank you, thank you. Hi, Team AutoClaude. Thank you for joining me today for your interview. Can you please introduce yourselves? Go ahead, Patricia. Uh, my name is Patricio Del Castillo. Uh, I'm from uh, Texas, uh, around the uh, DFW area. Uh, of course, doing electrical engineering. Um, my background is uh, nuclear energy and instrumentation and controls. Go ahead, Rodrigo. Yeah, so my name is Rodrigo. I'm also from Texas. I'm about uh, 20 miles away from Patricio. Um, you know, we're both graduating this, uh, this year. Um, my background is uh, military. I've been serving for more than eight years now, and um, I'm separating here soon. Um, uh, that's pretty much it. 
Awesome. That's so cool that you guys happen to be close. Do you, did you meet up to do any of a project? We did. Oh, you're so lucky. None of the other teams can do that. <laughs> yeah. I think in the beginning, we actually uh, kind of talked to each other and like, hey, you, you probably live really close to me. Do you want to like kind of be in the same team? That way it becomes easier if we need to like work together. So good strategy. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, tell me what auto quad is and what you did for your project. You want to start it off, Rodrigo? Yes. Yeah, so our um, so auto quad our project is uh, called uh, quadcopter position control, and our main objective is to replace the traditional um, you know joystick to um, using a single camera and that that allows us to control the drone using just that um, so we uh, we programmed it using OpenCV um, Python and uh, we built a prototype that allows us to uh, uh, to control the drone using just a single um, camera uh, you want you want to add anything to it uh, Patricia um. No, I mean, uh, as you said, we used OpenCV. A lot of the, the things that we uh, we went off, uh, we, we learned from existing kind of technologies that had uh, not something similar, but something uh, like a baseline of what uh, we were trying to achieve. So uh, it was a, a little bit of trial and error, but we um, kind of created our own uh, scripts and stuff based on uh, other individuals, uh, um, what they were working on. They weren't exactly working on what we were working on, but uh, we we definitely got inspired by a lot of individuals that are, are currently uh, diving really deep into uh, uh, machine learning and uh, OpenCV uh, video processing uh, technologies. Very interesting. And so your it would be controlled by a camera? That's right. Yes. Okay, so if I, how would that work? Where if you have your drone and you have your camera, what movements would you do in order to make the drone fly? So our, um, so our prototype. Um, so, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. So our prototype is, uh, we built two prototype configurations. Uh, one is arm uh, worn. So we, we're wearing uh, kind of like a, uh, a device and it's got the camera. And as we move around, uh, the ca the drone follows it. Um, uh, so, so our basic concept is to keep that drone at the center of that camera uh, camera view at all times. So as you move the camera, the uh, you know the drone follows it. Okay. And so, what are the real life applications for this? I mean, there's there's multiple applications. You can do go uh, down the entertainment route, and you can have it as a, a toy, right? But I mean, there's other applications as well. You can have uh, like a uh, a camera-based uh, drone for off a tank or something for uh, air support or something like that, where maybe um, you don't maybe there's a lot of interference uh, where you can't get radio frequency, but you can get line of sight uh, on certain things. Um, it, I mean, there's there's some technologies where we've seen where you can actually um, access another drone, you know, by visual. So, like, uh, I think Rodrigo was able to see this somewhere where uh, someone was able to hack someone else's drone just by uh, having a line of sight on it and kind of, yeah, I don't know. You know the details about that? Rodrigo? Yeah, so... So basically, the one uh, one uh, one of the projects that we um, I saw before was uh, this um, this person was able to to ma manipulate the signal of other drones around the area where his drone was and being able to control those drones. So basically, you know, take over the controls and he could pretty much get those drones. <laughs> wow, that is interesting. Yeah. So your project is intentional control over drones via line of sight. That's right. Not, <laughs> not what that guy did. <laughs> yes. Right. yes. Very interesting. And so you two are online and you have an in-person team member um, that I'll be speaking to as well. What was it like having a hybrid team? It was very challenging because one is the communication 
communication and the time difference. Um, and we all work different schedules. So Kyla is a night shift and both of uh, Patricia works really long hours and mine is a little bit more flexible. So we had to really um, schedule the time and become, you know, be smart about our, uh, you know, our communication and uh, uh, relaying information to one another. That way we're not re redoing um, experiments that one of us have already done. Yeah, th there was a, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uh, documentation of, you know, what each one was doing and trying to keep track of everything that uh, each one was researching. As, as uh, Rodrigo says, you know, we were trying not to do any overlap, but we also uh, very early on wanted to have some form of accountability, you know, so we were, you know, like Rodrigo said, we all had different schedules and uh, different uh, things that came in uh, uh, during the time that we were doing the project. Uh, Rodrigo had a child, um, you know. I, 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 there was days where uh, I had some crazy work going on, so uh, it, it kind of kept us on track. We 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 made a, a like a diary of all of our uh, advances, all the things that we were researching, and it kind of you know when one of us would falter or something like that, or one of us were you know, dragging behind uh, the other two, kind of like uh, hey, everything all right? So it was, that was like. Even though it's extra things that we had to do, it, it uh, really streamlined uh, the ability for us to, to, to get things done. Very good. Having that accountability is something that is very hard for some people to learn. So I think being in a hybrid team um, or even just an online team kind of forces that upon you if you've never had that experience before. Have either of you had that experience before in real life situations or previous jobs? Go ahead, Patricia. Go ahead. But uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, like I said, I work in the nuclear industry, so there's a lot of things that we have to document and there's a lot of accountability here. A lot of, uh, you know, if you say you're gonna do something, then a lot of people are depending on you to actually do that one thing um so yeah i mean as far as a, a project with other individuals online no but uh having that that sense of accountability yes uh, it's kind of day in and day out of my job uh, similar to mine because uh you know being in the military you you really have to be you know accountable and responsible for everything that you do especially in you know we deal with mission critical uh you know, uh, tasks, um, especially on deployment. So, you know, the, the military kind of uh, thought me uh, uh, to become accountable and responsible at early age. And, and it's, the same, it's the same with, uh, with Kyle, right? He, he also served? Yes. Yeah, so Kyle was also in the Navy for four years. And um, he, uh, you know, he separated after uh, the first enlistment and moved on. Very interesting. If there were anything that you could do differently for this project, what would you do? <laughs> uh, you you want to start it off, Rodrigo? <laughs> so, uh, do differently. I think um, not different, but um, improve it more, right? Because there's always room for improvement. So I think we built a very good uh, fundamentals of you know, being able to control a drone using a camera, which in our knowledge has never been done before. Um, so it, I think what we've done so far is I wouldn't change anything, right? So I would just continually uh, improve it. And with that, we can in improve the tracking system. There are, you know, I can go on and on, on, you know, how to improve this, but with, with our time uh, and for it, 488 and 489, I think we've maximized the potentials of this, uh, this project. I, I, I agree with Rodrigo. Um, I mean, if we were to redo this uh, project exactly as it is, I think we've reached uh, uh, the limitations or, or really close to the limitations of what we can achieve 
Now, if, if we're able to have a, a more freedom specifically with like the processor and stuff like that, I think we would have actually delved into using some other kind of processor because we could go into more advanced, uh, you know, technologies, uh, machine learning kind of things where we can actually program it to uh, identify the drone in, by a different manner than the manner that we, we took as an approach. Uh, and I feel that would probably um, bring uh, that next step of evolution, you know, towards this project. But no, yeah, if, if we were to keep everything the same, uh, it would be very difficult to, to see where we can find improvements. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today and congratulations on completing your project and your degrees. All thank right, you. thank you. Thanks guys, have a great day. You too. All right, you too. Bye -bye. Hi 5G team, thank you so much for meeting with me today to record your interview for the ECEE Senior Design Capstone Demo Day. Can you please introduce yourselves to me? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, my name is Luke Sawhusky, and uh, I actually live in Maryland, and uh, these are my teammates. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Jean Kwanda. I live uh, in Kingston, Ontario, in Canada. And yeah, this is my teammate. You're a fun bunch. And oh. my, na my name is Mike Schutz. I live in Erie, Colorado, and these are also my teammates. <laughs> 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 and you also have another teammate today who wasn't able to make it, Ryan, right? Yes, yeah. that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully Ryan watches this later and sees what fun he missed out on. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Can you tell me what you did for your senior design project? You are called 5G Team, so I'm assuming it's something to do with 5G? Yeah, so what we did was, our, our, what we did was we tried to implement some 5G technologies into the 4G system that we already have. So we took the idea of what's coming in wireless communications, and we tried to implement some of those onto a 4G system to see how they behave and see their viability. Um, so we started um, very basic. We built from the ground up using software-defined radios, a 4G system, and we basically built it from scratch in MATLAB and in GNU Radio, which is the software we used. We built it from scratch, um, validated it, and then we um, built a 5G uh, feature into it. And I'll let uh, Mike and, and John kind of expound on, on what that feature was. Yeah, yeah, so I can take over if you want, yeah. John. Go ahead, yeah. Um, so so one, of the, one of the key 5G features we were going after is basically called um, base station offloading. And what it means is, is basically where users, i.e. cell phone users or anyone on the cell network can relay the data to each other um, where it offloads or reduces the load on the cell networks. So let's say you wanted to download like a viral video. <clears throat> In a normal 4G system, the tower, the cell tower normally transmits that video to each individual user, each individual cell phone. Well, in 5G, there's a cool feature where we wanted to implement where the cell tower transmits it to one, one user and then that user can transmit it to other users as well. So you can get, you know, you can transmit one video through all a bunch of different end users and not use the main cell tower. So yeah. that's kind of our, our core, core goal here. Yeah, I think Mike Mike is spending very well. That's uh, that's a core um, the core of a uh, of our project. Uh, that's what we worked on. Um, so basically, like like Mike says, uh, the off uh, the offloading uh, feature of the five G. That's uh, that's that's one of the features that we focus on uh, for our project, and we are able to test it and uh, generate graph uh, for this as well. And uh, I don't know if we have a poster of that, that we can show it later on uh, during this interview. We'll be able to show it, to show what we have. 
So why is it important in order to offload it? Um, so if we're all using the cell towers anyways, um, is it better quality? Why is there a difference there? Uh, so it, it's basically to save bandwidth. Yeah. So the, the, the number of users using cell phones and, and wireless systems is only going up. Mm -hmm. And as there become more and more users, which is not necessarily cell phones, it could be cars, it could be anything. The amount of data moving around in the system is huge. So if you can take that load from the main cell towers and move it to a smaller network, which may be person to person or vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to person, you've essentially reduced your, your total network um, load mm -hmm. and increase the capacity just by offloading that information to another user who can then offload it to another user who can offload it to another user. Yeah. And then also this is a, I don't know, uh, I can add to what Luke said, I think that also will, will increase the speed as well. So instead of each user going back to the tower and requesting the same data that another user is already using, uh, they can just offload it from each other. Uh, so user two will send it, uh, the same data to user three that requests the same data, let's say there's a video that went viral. Instead of going back to the tower, they can just you know share amongst them. So just offloading the, the tower because the number of user increases. So that just reduces the, um, the traffic that's going back to the, to the main tower. Interesting. How would it work in remote places that don't have as reliable um, access to the cellular cellular network. So, <laughs> I mean, in a, situa in a situation like that, that's a weird question. Sure. <laughs> okay. I think it would actually be beneficial because if the data can get to a user that's local, so if there is a a reliable connection. Okay. that that user or endpoint becomes another reliable connection to people that are nearby. So 5G is going to, because of the higher frequencies and the higher bandwidths, it, it is more localized than 4G. So mm -hmm. there will be more towers and, and more access points spread across shorter distances. Mm -hmm. And if the user can become one of those towers, so to speak, you would actually increase, you know, the quality of service to any given user. Very interesting. So you're all online and you're all all over the world. Um, so Maryland, was that said, and Canada, what was it like working with such varied locations and time zones? Did you have any issues with that? <laughs> No, um, not at all. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, for some of us who live in the other part of, uh, <laughs> of geographically, it was easy, but uh, I don't know. I think, I think we all managed and uh, made it work uh, by just communicating more and having a platform that we can all log in and just let each other know uh, what's going on and on a daily basis and weekly basis as well. And for me being in Canada, you know, so time difference, three hours, and, uh, you know, but you just, you just make it work. <laughs> so, yeah. great answer you just make it work <laughs> and the other thing that was really challenging for us is the, the the radios that we were used which were supplied by um the university were actually in uh, a lab at the university so not only are we all remote we were actually remoting into the hardware that we were using which is at the university so we had to use a vpn each one of us to remote into the school to use those radios to accomplish what we were doing. So it was truly distributed. We are all distributed and our project was distributed from us. Which was, <laughs> and it, it was challenging because it's, yeah. you know, the nature of the internet, there is delay. And when you're yeah. trying to work on systems like That's that, right. it can be yeah. a little frustrating. To say the least. You get disconnected, you have to ask the professor to connect. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There were a few times when we had to reboot, you know, <laughs> either either we crashed the machine or we had to reboot the machine. And That's luckily right. the professor was very, very helpful. Doing very helpful, that. yeah. <laughs> Which faculty member were you working with? Oh, gosh. I it's uh, Dr. Ahmed Iwaisha. Iwaisha. Yeah. Is that how you say that? He's awesome. 
He yeah. is. He graduated from our program. I've worked very closely with him for several years. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's, he's been, been, yeah, he's yeah, been really a great helpful. help, and uh, he's guided us along this, this project the entire time. That's yeah. fantastic, and that's one of the things we try and encourage with the capstone of having a good working relationship with the faculty and being able to use the university resources and have access when you need them. So I'm glad that really worked out for you. Yeah, yeah, it did. Definitely did, yeah. yeah. Well, if there were one thing that you could do differently, um, what would you do? Well, we're still, we're still trying to figure out with the first, you know, the, the pioneer of, uh, you know, the team that are doing it all online, but, <laughs> um, uh, I don't know what we'll do differently, guys. I, uh, I think, I think uh, what we, I think, I don't know. This, that, that one is. Uh, That's hard to say. Um, I think having one of the things that I would would have liked to have had is actual hardware to yeah. to play with. Mm. Um, it, working remotely, like like the guys mentioned before, was difficult when we had to wait for someone to you know reboot the machine. At, at the lab at ASU, um, things like that, where like if we would if we were to be able to have not only hardware in hand but the budget to do so, um, it it would have been a little easier at times when we were stuck. Yeah, I mean, even if it was just for troubleshooting, and then we just tested the real stuff back at the university, it would have been. I I, I agree with Mike 100. Yeah. That would have yeah. been very helpful. Yeah, actually, I do agree too. Yeah, that's definitely right. <laughs> Interesting. Well, congratulations on being pioneers <laughs> on the project and your program. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Len. Our next interview is with the Split Zone HVAC team. Can you please introduce yourselves? Hi, my name is Jason Bishop. I'm one of the team members of Split Zone HVAC, working on a uh, electrical engineering uh, bachelor's degree online ASU. Jason Murrowball here. Uh, my role in the project, I did a lot of the hardware selection, uh, a little bit of the coding, and I actually have the working model on my desk. Ooh, that'll be fun. Uh, hi, I'm Edwin Short. Um, my main role in the project was to do most of the coding. I also designed and coded the mobile app for our project. Hi, my name is Brian Schulteis. Uh, I focused more on like the data analysis and the clerical side of the project. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining me today for your interview. Can one of you please tell me what you did for your project? So I'll take that one. Um, for our project, uh, we focus on a, a, it's called split zone HVAC. And the, the, prob the problem that we identified is that uh, one of the major uses of electricity in a, in a home or residence is gonna be the, the, the air conditioning of it, you know, heating or cooling. Uh, the issue is that you know you're either heating or cooling an entire house, and uh, we wanted to make that more efficient. And by making that more efficient, you will save electricity and, and hopefully be more comfortable. So the split zone HVAC is is meant to be able to split your zone in the existing home or residence uh, with an existing HVAC system that we can uh, uh, shut off rooms to move the cooling or heating air to specific zones uh, as needed. Very interesting. And so you mentioned a mobile app. So you can control the entire system from your phone. Yes, yeah. Well, you can uh, manually control the vent. You can open and close it to certain degrees of, like you want it 20% open, you can do that. or. 60% or 100%. Um, you can also set the temperature you want for the room. So you can tell it, like, I want my room to be at 70 degrees. And that'll actually tie into the auto mode of the uh, vent. Very cool. So who has the working model? Remind me. 
No, that would be JR. I I have it. I don't have it set up though. I should. You know, okay, <laughs> that's fine. You don't have to like hoist up this thing for to show me. Um, but it works. You have a working model of it. Uh, yeah, it works. Um, it it'll have some hiccups where you have to cycle power to to the boards, but uh, it works. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, how much did your project cost? All in all, we probably have about $250 into it. Uh, the bulk of that was a uh, automation and robotics kit that we found off of Amazon that had just a bunch of miscellaneous parts for a project like this. We probably used uh, six or seven components out of that maybe. Um, and then this semester, I spent like 40 bucks at Lowe's to build the boxes for it to put it all together. That's a pretty decent cost. Um, I hear that there's another team that might have spent about $3,000 on something. Something that's going to space. So 250 good job, guys. Uh, <laughs> what was that? We, we didn't have a working budget that size. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm always interested in the cost of these projects because I know that you are students. Uh, so. You want to make sure that you are making something that is cost effective, but will work. So good job on doing that and accomplishing that. So as an online team, um, where are you all located? Are you anywhere close to each other? Or are you across like completely different time zones? Yeah, we're pretty uh, far I'm apart. In, oh. But I, I'm in Delaware myself, so. And then JR, you're in West Virginia, right? Good. I'm in West uh, Morgantown, West Virginia. The same time zone as Brian. We're the only ones in the same time zone, I believe. <laughs> Did you guys have any issues overcoming that? Uh, we've been pretty good about communicating, staying in contact. Uh, we set up a weekly meeting that kind of helped us stay on task. That's awesome. That can be a real challenge when you're working in such a, you know, dispersed team. Um, so I'm always interested to hear how our online teammates are able to accomplish that. If there were anything that you could do differently with your project, what would you do? Um. Maybe start coding a little earlier. Okay, when did you guys start coding for the project? Uh, we started coding this semester. This um, semester? Okay. Yeah. Uh, most of it was, uh, we had gotten the basic model of moving the servos for the vent around. Um, and then uh, if we had made the decision for the mobile app a little sooner, it probably would have made it a little more easier to get implemented and coded correctly. So before you had the mobile app, how were you going to control um, the vents? Uh, it was initially gonna be through just an auto mode. And then it was kinda, we thought about it and we needed more uh, manual control and probably people wanna open and close it manually, so. That's a good change to make and I don't, feel like it was too last minute of a change. Um, from what I've heard from other teams, they do a lot of the planning stage in that first semester and then the actual building and creating in the second semester. So you guys are probably right on target with that. Is there anything else that you would change? All right, I just want to give you the opportunity just in case you thought of something. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier that you, you, you're graduating and this is your, the last step for your, your program. Maybe one or two of you have a couple more courses left. Um, overall, how did you find the online program to be? Uh, I liked it actually, it worked well yeah. with my schedule. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, overall, I liked it. 
Um, it was, it worked well with my work schedule. Uh, I travel a lot for work, so being in an online school kind of helped in that aspect. That's awesome. I'm really glad to hear that. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, guys. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on completing your project and your degrees. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for joining me, Team PV Daylight. Can you please introduce yourselves? Sure, my name's uh, Michael Anke. Um, I live in East Tennessee, Sevierville, Pigeon Forge area. I think Dollywood. I have two jobs. I work as a um, intern right now at the local utility. I'm also working at Starbucks on the weekends because they're currently doing the tuition reimbursement thing. Oh, so it's allowing me to go to school. So. Yeah, I'm Daniel Womble. Um, of course, a senior. All of us. Uh, I'm uh, active duty military. I've been in the service for about 16 years now. Uh, we're in uh, North Carolina right now. That's about it. I'm Mike Shirley. I'm from uh, Southern California. I'm prior Air Force. I still work at the Air Force Base, close to where I live, Edwards Air Force Base, and I manage a team of engineers and technicians at the Bennett Field and Co. Facility. Awesome. Tyler, can you introduce yourself to us? Sure. Hello, my name is Tyler Blundo. Um, I am a shift supervisor at a Starbucks. Uh, like everyone else, obviously an undergrad major, applying for a PhD program right now. Now, sorry for being late. <laughs> That's and okay. I had this. Uh, my schedule is being tomorrow. Actually, I don't know why. Oh. <laughs> Well, that's one of the struggles of being an online team, of trying to align all your schedules in the different time zones, and we can talk about that in a couple of minutes. Your team name is PV Daylight, so I have a feeling you do something with solar. Uh, can you tell me about your project and what you've been working on for the past year? The intent of the project was to design a, uh, uh, a basically a uh, PV cell into a... Um, I don't know how would you say it, um, a skylight. I mean, I would like to work to a skylight with PV cell. And then uh, you're, you're going to pull off some uh, extra electricity through the PV cell. And then you would uh, allow some of that daylight in uh, so that you can uh, uh, remove some of the bad light and allow light into the facility. And maybe you can cut back on some uh, uh, lighting bill. Um, I think at the end of the day, that's not 100% how it ended up being, but uh, to get there in the beginning, we sat there and, and went through multiple different designs, um, uh, looked at how we could optimize uh, different solutions for this problem. Uh, we ended up doing some coding, modeling, uh, uh, incident rays coming into uh, a facility. Um, we had a look at different uh, time zones, uh, different locations in the, in the Earth, uh, it made it a little bit more difficult. Um, eventually, we ended up with Arizona having slightly more flat uh, uh, rooftops, so we kind of just used the uh, a 90 degree uh, angle to be modeling this. Um, and at the end of the day, we came down to about two solid designs, but we couldn't get over uh, an obstacle using a um, what was that reflective reflective tape. Um, that might surely have it was, grading. It was a traction grading. grading. Yes. yes. So yeah, it was like completely infeasible. So Tyler, uh, Tyler had designed this thing with prisms, uh, where you put these prisms in kind of like delta, but it's upside down, and uh, uh, the the light comes in and reflects to uh, into onto uh, or reflects onto uh, 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 horizontal PV cells that are horizontal to the uh, rooftop. And then uh, they collect the uh, incident rays that way and, and generate some uh, electricity. Um, that's kind of what we ended up doing in the end. Uh, and Tyler went over during the summer to Arizona State University and was able to put a prototype together, uh, which was phenomenal. Um, a plus in our book. But uh, and that's kind of uh, the beginning of the project right there. I don't know if you want to take off in there, Tyler. Sure. So um, me and a couple of grad student mentors put together a prototype of skylight design. So we, uh, it was essentially a box built out of black plexiglass. And like Daniel said, we used triangular glass prisms 
cheap ones that you can just buy on Amazon uh, in the form of like a delta pattern, right, an upside down delta. So it's a triangular glass array, and we uh, use um, solar cells fabricated in macro technology work. They were just simple, diffuse jumps in silicon, nothing special. Uh, very pretty much just industry standard for like low end solar, in my understanding. And the design itself is. Um, to flank the, the uh, interior of a, a traditional building skylight with solar cells and to use this, uh, these refractive array of glass prisms to bend the light outward towards the vertical cells uh, using, you know, based on the concept of a total internal reflection of, um, you know, sort of described by Snell's law. Michael Anke, I think I'm probably mispronouncing your name. Um, do you want to tell us what your contribution to the project was? I helped with the um, putting together a lot of the presentations that we did for the TAs, scripting out some of that to give the guys an idea of what they would want to say and make things flow smoothly, as well as um, being involved with the initial design process and the uh, um, final decision in the uh, which model of skylight we ended up using. Very cool. And so, Michael Shirley, can you tell me how much your project cost? I don't know exactly how much the project cost because a lot of this stuff was fabricated with Tyler over the summer at the facilities, and I believe there was no cost associated with much of that. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, for us, yeah, we didn't pay anything out of pocket. It was funded by the NSF. Bucky us. Very cool. That's awesome. And so you're all you're all over the country, and you all have full time jobs. Some of you have multiple jobs. What was it like trying to coordinate working on this project together? Because you've been working on this for about a year. Did you have any rough parts at the beginning that you were able to, you know, smooth out and work through? Tell me what your process was. I'll, I'll give that one a shot. Um, I'm on the West Coast and everyone else is on the East Coast. So there was a, a challenge with just, the, you know, the times that I get off work compared to when everyone else gets off work. Um, I have a pretty standard eight hour job where you know, my, my schedule is pretty consistent. I think some of the other guys kind of had a little bit different schedules. So there was there was some challenges that we had to face with being able to line all that stuff up. We um, used our uh, communication very well. We were able to constantly stay in touch with each other and uh, relay the messages that if someone wasn't going to be able to be involved in one of the calls or one of the chats, you know, that they would get caught up with someone else later on. And uh, for the most part, we just communicated very well. And I think we did a really good job, um, you know, trying to make sure everyone was uh at, at the place they needed to be at the right time. And if not, everything was communicated afterwards. Communication is key. And that's one of the points of the senior design capstone in which, you know, as students, you have to work in a group setting and go through the entire process of creating something, working in a group, you know, presenting it to the TAs and to myself now uh, to give you that real world experience. Uh, when you're presenting to the TAs, what kind of feedback do they give you? So the question, what was the feedback from the TAs? Um, I do believe that they didn't understand what uh, we were trying to accomplish in the beginning very well. I think it took them a while. I, 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 I um, visited them for office hours multiple times. Towards the end of the semester, I'm pretty sure at least one of them understood the concept. Um, <laughs> so, and, and more recently, I think they're actually rather impressed by our progress. So That's cool. awesome. That's really good. If there were anything that you could do differently, and anyone can answer this, what would you do differently for this project? I would have been on time for this meeting. <laughs> Great answer. If, I would have liked to have joined over the summer on campus, but it just wasn't realistic. But I think that would have been you know, really beneficial for, for more of us to have that hands-on experience and that opportunity. Anything else that you guys would have done differently? I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, I got to do a couple of conference, um, like conference speaking engagements, so that was exciting. 
That's awesome. I'm glad you had a great experience. Um, so you guys are all graduating this semester, yes? I'm graduating. They're all graduating. In this, okay. With online students, sometimes it's a little bit staggered, yeah. So congratulations on completing your project, and congratulations on completing your degree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.